Hello and welcome to episode 34 of Zapped to the Past. I am Adrian Mills and I'm joined as always by Graham Raddings. If you haven't listened before, this is a podcast where we discuss games that were released for the Commodore 64. Last week, we looked at our first batch of games from issue 17 of Zap 64, which we are in no way affiliated with and were knocked out by Night Games, nonplussed by Ninja Master and frazzled by Floyd the Droid. This week... We conclude our look at the games in September 1986, along with what was lighting up our TV and cinema screens. Graham, with all the panache of a Captain Kirk dive, tell us what we can look forward to. In this massive salad bowl of an episode, we strap on our armour again to rescue a princess. Again. Only this time we test our joystick reaction times and reflexes to the max with the daringly daft Dragon's Lair. We also explore the dreary green and blue ups and downs of the wearisome Wing Commander and blend politics with puzzles in the block shifting and baffling split personalities. We also go up and down lifts, sneaking around offices, searching through furniture, again, in the Mission Impossible inspired Mission Elevator, plant the trees to kill the spiders to stop the eggs to use the lotion or it gets the hose again with the nonsensical necromancer and get angry at the blocky and ridiculous gargoyle strewn levels of Freaky Factory. If that crop of tomatoes isn't enough to line your salad plate, we also find ourselves at odds with the repetitive and dispiriting yet oddly addictive Hercules, turn to page crap and get angry with the numpty ninjas of Way of the Tiger and go full robotic and then in and out of doors, climbing stairs and searching through even more office furniture looking for, I don't know, loose change, a quid, in the decidedly dull droids. Finally, we grab a pair of headphones and enjoy the trap demo. Oh, and we also try the crap game wash our mouths out with bleach at the lump of crap tasting session that is Formula One Simulator before visiting the world's most pointless and visually dry heaving casino game to enter no money to win no money by winning no money with the violating video poker. AD, some of these games are like finding a turd in a hot tub. Just pray it never happens to you, AD. Mm, groovy. <laughs> so, what's first? <laughs> We've got another arcade conversion to start this week off. So, this one didn't get the gold medal because this one is Dragon's Lair. So, Dragon's Lair. What is Dragon's Lair? Now, I've started this off with just a little statement, which is uh, that some conversions are tough but doable. And that, just keep that thought in your mind. Okay, just have that, that thought there. So, let's go back a bit, because I think this needs a little bit of... For those who don't know what Dragon's Lair is, this needs a little bit of explaining, because the Commodore 64 version it of does. Dragon's Lair is not really what the arcade version of Dragon's Lair was. So, what is Dragon's Lair? So... Back in 1986, uh, we've already stated this, arcades were, you know, they were getting ahead of hardware that was built and released, you know, four years prior. The Commodore 64 came out in 1982, we're now in 1986, this hardware is four years old. Arcades were a constantly evolving platform with new hardware and new machines and everything like that. Well, this one actually came out in 1983, so not so far ahead, you might think. The problem was with Dragon's Lair... Is Dragon's Lair is not your typical arcade game. Mm-mm. Dragon's Lair, released in 1983, was con- created by a guy called Ron Dyer uh, on something called the Fantasy Engine or something, but was actually animated by Don Bluth's studio. So the people behind The Secret of Nim, The Land Before Time, these are ex-Disney animators. So this was proper animation. This, this is not sprites. This is not 16 color sprites, 32 color sprites, whatever it is. This is cell shaded animation from industry standard animators of the time hand animators okay. yeah yeah hand animators this was this, this looked nothing more, more this was nothing less than a full-fledged cartoon yep that you would see on your tv that you would see on your cinema so okay that's what this was that's what dragon's lair is and 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 that's what the games of lure was back then because nothing else looked like this really there was nothing else um you went into an arcade and you saw dragon's lair running and pretty much when you first looked at it you would jaw drop it was a jaw dropping moment because you did there was nothing, nothing close to it. Mind blowing. And it was crazy, crazy that there was a joystick attached to it. And he's like, "Hang on a minute, we can play this." Well, mm, play, play is a word, isn't it? Play is a word. So 
because the gameplay for this is another matter because Dragon's Lair was all built around memory test and reaction from the player. We've spoken about this before and that I'm, I think, and I think you've said this, so, and I think you could be right that this arguably is the birth of the, you know, uh, technique that would be pioneered in games later on, like Shenmue and God of War, which is the, the QTE, the quick time event. Yes, it is. Because this is a game built around quick time events. So we all know what quick time events are these days. This game is, is just an entire game built around it, which is basically you push the direction of a button, you know, you push the joystick or you press a button at a certain time to for something to happen in game. There's not much in the way of mechanics beyond that. And this game is built entirely around that. So what is this game? What is Dragon's Lair? Similar, very similar actually, to uh, Ghosts and Goblins, really, the plot. Mm. Um, yes, in, Essentially, it's the, it's the same story. Princess gets kidnapped, kidnapped by a monster. You have to go rescue her. And this time it's not, what was a uh, Princess... Pr- Princess Primprin. This is Princess Daphne, mm-hmm. um, and you are you are playing Dirk the Daring, and you must go rescue her from the evil Smaug the Dragon. So to do this, you've got to go through a series of challenges on the way to killing the dragon. Many many screens of instant death because you don't push in the right direction. In very many 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 animated ways, um, and all this at the end, you get a kiss from Daphne. And this was something I didn't know, but having a quick look around today, come to Wikipedia. Daphne was based on images from Playboy. Yeah, you can see that in the character when you actually. I was going to say. It, yeah, w- so- Right. Yeah, which, which explains a lot. Because it was, it was done on such a shoestring budget, they couldn't afford any uh, body doubles or anything yeah. to animate from. Which is so amazing, they just got really, images from Playboy. Right. It is, but explains a lot. Because Daphne it is does. a problematic um, yes. representation, shall we say. Yes. So keep all that in mind. This was an animated cartoon that you essentially played in an arcade from a Laserdisc. It ran from a Laserdisc player when you <laughs> I read that. Because uh, the, this this arcade was very prone to breaking. Because Laserdiscs are not, were not built to be read so quickly in kicked. different directions all over the place kicked whatever and so you know laser discs were essentially early uh, sort of dvd players really they were a video disc and so this is if, if you try playing any kind of game on an old dvd player you got those games you sometimes play they're not very good this is the same it, in 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 itself of the gameplay is a bit weak so this was all about the visuals this was all about the cartoon and then it gets ported to the commodore 64 so i i <laughs> You've got to. Exp- <laughs> I don't know if you would get given the job and go, I'll port Dragon's Lair to the C64. At what point are you thinking, what? A. There's a bit in the interview mm. with uh, Chris Butler where they mention he's doing Space Area. Space Area. So he's, 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 and Gary Penn's like, Space Area? Are you joking? Well, imagine him saying <laughs> Dragon's Lair. Be even more. He'd be like, what? On the C64? What? So, okay. That aside, let's push that to one side for a moment. What do we have in this in this game? So in this game, we have nine nine rooms, nine sort of quick time event, well, some platforming bits to get through. And they are a falling disc, some grabbing bones, where bones try and grab you. We have fiery platforms, which is a simple platform and swinging on ropes. We have the re- weapons room where weapons float around and you have to press the right direction to avoid them. There's some isometric platformer thing where you're trying to kill off some rats or something there's a tentacle room which is very much like the grabbing bones and the weapons room we have the other another falling disc exactly the same we have the deadly chessboard where you have to run alongside the the knight who's trying to pulse things and kill it and then you have slaying the dragon which looks very similar to the level in captain toad's treasure tracker mm. where you're trying to uh jump on the thing where you're avoiding it you're hiding behind rocks and trying to get the place to yep. and blah 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 very similar and so and because that's it, really. So you do those. The, the, the gameplay ranges from basic platforming or running into the wind when you're on the platform, when you're on the floating disc, which is very annoying because the collision detection on the edge of the platforms is quite questionable. Or you're pushing the joystick in the right direction to leap or hack that way or whatever. It's all very prescribed. And there's a very, very clever, what, you know, what seems like a very clever tape loading system in this game which is essentially it would load in the first t- first game, the first level. And while you were playing that, in the background, it would be loading in the next level. So as soon as you finish that at that level, you would instantly be into the next one. And then it would start loading. And like very clever memory management going on here and wiping stuff out and everything like that. The problem with that is that trying to keep two levels in memory means that the levels are not that big or interesting because they can't they can only have so much, you know, they've only got so much space for it. They can't use the entire 64K and then clear it out and load the rest. They're, they're doing this. And it's a clever tape loader. Don't get me wrong. It's, it's impressive. The problem was that none of the levels, none of the stages in this version of it are very interesting. They're a bit boring. They're a bit dull. They're a bit prescribed. They suffer from trying to be like the arcade, but not like the arcade. So they don't have the wow factor um, of the visuals. As I've said, some conversions are tough but doable. But in my opinion, some should never have been attempted. And this is one of the latter, in my opinion. 
this is a port too far for the C64, and I don't really understand why it was done. I do, because it was a name, but it was a name that wasn't, I think, three years down the line. I'm not even sure it had that much in the way of sort of, you know, goodwill towards it, because I think people have got very bored of Dragon's Lair by this point. So, I don't know, this doesn't, it's not a great game in any way, shape or form. It has a clever technical tape loader attached to it. That's about it. What did you think? I'm very similar, actually. It was always going to be a crazily ambitious idea to try and convert something of the volume and size and scale of Dragon's Lair, an arcade which, as you've very accurately described, is essentially an animated movie cut into little slices, and make any kind of port out of that on an 8-bit computer. And it isn't for want of trying. It's not... I mean, there's so many different and unusual versions of Dragon's Lair. It's kind of persisted. It's a strange game that's kind of persisted, I think because of its... It is a monstrously important title in the realms of the arcade. So it's it was one of those arcade games that was a landmark, benchmark arcade. And everyone remembers their first encounter with it because the attract sequence was so damn loud. Dragon's Lair, a fantasy adventure where you become a valiant knight on a quest to rescue the fair princess from the clutches of an evil dragon. <laughs> You control the actions of a daring adventurer finding his way through the castle of a dark wizard who has enchanted it with treacherous monsters and obstacles. In the mysterious caverns below the castle, your odyssey continues against the awesome forces that oppose your efforts to reach the dragon slayer. Lead on, adventurer. Your quest awaits. And you could hear this thing from like 20 miles away, you know, and who can forget that a track sequence, you know, Dragon's Lure, you know, and, and it was amazing to look at and, and everyone, it was also more expensive. I think it was about 50p a go in the arcade, maybe even a pound. Yeah, I don't know. yeah, it was. So it had all of those things. Now, as you say, the idea of converting something like that into something that's functional on a 8-bit machine is ridiculous and, and there's no way around that it is. So you're never going to get that. And so the Commodore 64 port isn't the first port of, of Dragon's Lair. It actually was ported to the Coleco Adam prior to that. And the Coleco... Oh, really? and the, Yeah, and the Col- you can, if you YouTube the Coleco Adam version of Dragon's Lair, what you're going to see is a 8-bit version of Dragon's Lair, which all of the other 8-bit versions were based upon, including the Commodore 64. So that, ah, that, right, that, okay. that, that graphic of Dirk where he's kind of stood there and he kind of does that kind of shift to the left and right, the disc dropping down, the whole thematic of that 8-bit version was based upon the Coleco Adam version. So all of the other ports are not really based on the arcade. They're based on that. So taking that into account, like but you said... But, you would, but, but surely that, that first one had to be based on the arcade. Uh, yeah, and, or... and I think the, way, the best thing you can say is that it's thematically based upon the levels because mm. then you're never going to get that kind of animation into anything other than a laser disc really yeah. so they're thematically based and that is that is a problem because what you are not converting as an arcade you're making it, it would have been more honest to say a game based on you know and if they can base a game on a soundtrack of a film they can base a game on the <laughs> you know the animation of an arcade they can do that mm-hmm. and so you end up with this c64 version now I actually bought Dragon's Lair. I'm, I am, in the background, a massive fan of Dragon's Lair, but I also hate it. So I really like Dragon's Lair because I think it's very important graphically, and, and I don't mean that in terms of its quality of graphics, and in terms of the, the idea of the QTE and, the, and what it became, what it led to. The, the lineage of Dragon's Lair is long. There's a sequel to Dragon's Lair in arcade. There's, there's Space Ace as well. It wasn't the only Don Bluth a Cinematronics arcade that came out that based itself on Laserdiscs. And let's not even talk about the god-awful Firefox laser this game in the arcade. So there was the kind of a thing about those kind of games. So the Commodore 64 version, the graphics are kind of very similar to the Coleco Adam version. So they're kind of 8-bit chunky versions, limited colors, as you'd expect them to be. So mm-hmm. the problem then becomes, okay, if you're taking elements from the arcade and making them into a game, how good is the game you're making out of those elements? Because there's enough fodder there to make a mini platform game or a mini run around game. You could ha- be hacking the giddy goons with a sword. You can be doing those things. And that's kind of what they tried. Unfortunately, it doesn't work in this instance. So you end up with a quite, kind of a awkwardly animated Dirk the Daring sprite. I hesitate to use that term, but that's what it kind of is. Sort of badly jumping around, often dying for no real reason whatsoever. I mean, how many times do you die jumping off the platform onto the disc thing on the very first level? Yeah. Just, just yep, You yep. just die. So it's unforgiving, difficult, 
not based around quick time events because they don't, with, oh, it kind of is in some of the levels, but not really working very well. These kind of games, I don't know how really how they work in a system where it has to continuously load and reload and do all of that slowness in the background. So to the point when, I don't know how many times I saw that animation sequence when you die, so where he dropped to a skeleton, and then he gets rebuilt. I must have seen that like a billion times. I'm like, just I need to skip that sequence. I need to skip. Yep. And it's those parts where they're trying to bring bits of the arcade in, because the arcade does that. Does that when you die, you get this kind of little mini animations. So they've tried to put a square pig in a round hole, try to fit an enormous arcade into a very small amount of memory, and it just doesn't work. And it was never going to work. So you end up with this super hard, as you very rightly say, squashed, because with this loading scheme you're squashing the game into probably 30k i guess i don't know quite how much was given to each game but not a lot and as much as that's clever what it does do is limit everything so you end up with next to nothing on the screens other than the basic level graphics and you as you progress through the game it doesn't get much better and you it, it's really just a collection of mini games based on the theme of a dragon's lair which mm -hmm. aren't very good there's some nice graphics here and there where they've taken a screen from the arcade, which is like the castle image, because there's a famous image of the castle where it zooms in. Yeah, that yeah, image yeah. is in the C64 version, albeit that it's a st still. But it's quite nicely rendered, whether it's a scan or whether it's drawn, I don't know. But it's it's quite those little bits like that are nicely done, but they're very few and far between. In what is essentially quite a difficult and unplayable and overly challenging and disappointing version of Dragon's Lair, because there's no way that... And I remember it when I loaded it in, and feeling that disappointment, there's no way. I didn't expect Dragon's Lair on the C64. I just expected more Dragon's Lair than I got. What I got was kind of a unbranded Aldi version of Dragon's Lair <laughs> with a Dirk the Daring-ish looking blodge flinging his sword around and kind of... And there's some big graphics in and animations in this game as well. It just doesn't pay off. And so I think the Zap review was 69%. I have to say, I think it's generous. I'd have given it a lot less. I think I'd have been in the 40s for this because I think it's... Yeah, um, I think so too. And I think you, you, you can either applaud the ambition, but ambition's great, but if it fails, it's not ambitious, it's a failure. You know, there's, mm -hmm. there's, and there's many great ambitious projects... And, you know, but if it's a game, it doesn't work because a game can be ambitious. But if it's not playable, it's then it's not ambitious. It was futile. And I think that's where I landed with it. And on my revisit, I felt exactly the same. And I did a bit of digging into the history of Dragon Slayer because I was quite, I find it quite fascinating. The whole idea of that it came out in 1983 is incredibly early, earlier than I imagined yeah. it was. I remember seeing the arcade game in Cleethorpe's. I remember seeing it and, and having that moment like you must have had, like everybody had. And I can, the only thing I can liken it to was the very first time I saw an Amiga running, um, which literally blew my mind. When I remember seeing, um, I think it was actually Defender of the Crown running on an Amiga, way, way in its earliest days. So re I remember there was a, a very, <laughs> a software rental place in Grimsby called j &M Software, which we've mentioned a few times, but it was there. And they did an Amiga day where people could go down. I think they were the only person I know who had an Amiga at the time. They were very expensive. And I remember it was showing off essentially. And, and Defender of the Crown was one of the games that was being shown. And I just remember being blown away by it and then funny enough ironically and to just bring this full circle one of the greater versions of dragon's lair was later the amiga version which actually brought back all of the animated stuff that was missing from every other version kind of brought the arcade back and then from there it just continued to be a version of a version of a version it wouldn't surprise me if there was a bloody iphone version nowadays of this because the end of the day it's just an animation chopped into pieces with a qte attached and Nowadays, it seems yeah. ridiculously simple to do. Back then, of course, it was revolutionary. There's horrible gaps in the arcade. Do you remember the gaps in the arcade? So you do, you mm -hmm. might get through a sequence, and there'd just be a black gap, and then you'd see dirt running for a second, and there'd be a black gap, and then and yeah. it was kind of blodgy and didn't quite work, and it was skippy, and you'd die for no reason, and oh, I didn't. Yeah. Now, I know with it was, hindsight, it was ported. To, it was ported to a DVD. I remember it being it on was. DVD because you, you could play it on a DVD player just with your remote control, couldn't you? I remember there's a version of that. There is. I mean, if you look at the... There's, I mean, I obviously haven't got time to go into Which all makes the sense, history. Really. But there's loads of versions of this. I think there's a... There's actually quite a recent version, which is the com more complete version. There's there's even a version released later, believe it or not, on the ZX81. So, <laughs> oh wow! You think you can't cram it into a? I mean, I, I think really it's just playing full motion video on a ZX81. I don't I don't know the technology of that. Yeah, probably. But the thing is with Dragon's Lair is that I, I mean, thinking about it is I mean, is this? 
I don't know if there's something prior to it. Maybe there is. But is this the sort of advent of the sort of FMV game? So your things like that would lead to your, your night traps. It is, yeah. Um, and and that sort of and those kind of games we played on uh, the CDI and yeah, that, that, that all those you know essentially rubbish stuff. All that would then lead to the, you know games like Her Story down the line, which obviously much better than yeah. telling lies. But this is like the start of those games, which are minimal, minimal input, full FMV. And, and Night Trap was obviously a a, a, a particular one that uh, that sticks in your mind for obviously all the wrong reasons. Mm. Um, but because that was on the Mega Drive, wasn't it? I think Night uh, Trap, Mega CD, Mega, yeah. Drive? Mega CD, yeah. So that's you know this is you can see why this is a you know an important game, but it is this con- this conversion is uh, like I said, it's just it's no point really. No, you might as well have just done you might as well have just done the adventures of Dirk the Daring and made a separate yes. game where you had to go through the castle it is and, and it's curious because they didn't pick all of the levels out of the arcade to redo so i think the arcade's got 12 or maybe 18 le- level yeah, and I, they're lot, not levels yeah. it's i think it's what's important to perhaps without going on the and scene, on about dragon slayer scenes, yeah, they? They, yeah they are scenes and they're actually in random the only sequence that you play in the arcade you play the first sequence when you first start and the last sequence when you fight Singe, the dragon, everything in between there is random. So if you die, you start at a random scene. You don't, there's no lineage to that. There's no sequence of events. You just have to complete all 18 or however many there are of the scenes. I think it's 18, but it could be less. I don't know. Somebody will correct me on that. But you have to complete the scenes yeah. in no matter what order they're presented to you to get to the final battle with Singe. And it's not really a battle with Singe because you kind of run in and smack her. Uh, the glass globe i think and stab the magic sword because you have to get the magic sword out of the glass globe daphne gives you a magic key i think you do that stab the dragon he dies and then it's uh, kissing uh, the big boob princess yeah so like i said i suppose oh, singe, you know i said smaug i was like yeah apologies but, for that. i said smaug it's dragon singe I've, I've, been, I've been watching the hobbit recently that's probably why it's but uh, i suppose my final thought on this is is this if you take the arcade and i, I look at this as there being two versions of dragon's lair there's the arcade versions and the derivatives of it. So the ones that look like mm-hmm. the arcade, the DVDs, the Amiga version, and the later more capable consoles and the more capable machines. And there's even, a, an, I think, an emulator now for PC that does it. And there are the 8-bit uh, Coleco Adam derivative ports, the Spectrum, the C64, the Coleco Adam, and there's loads of others. So I think there's even a version of this on the SNES or the NES or one of the one of the probably one of those consoles and that's kind of a weird platform a la sort of uh, castle of illusions type you know character jumping up and down platforms so there's that version and i think the two are separate and this isn't even still a very good version of that version so oddly a better version comes along later but we'll talk about that later down the line we will so there you go dragon's lair should it have been done they were so interested in seeing if they could they never stopped to <laughs> ask if they, they should. should exactly uh, and there you go <laughs> Which is what you could say for the next game. <laughs> so, uh, Graham, Wing Commander, tell us all about it, Field Marshal Graham. Well, my review of this starts with the words utterly crap, <laughs> and it doesn't get much better from there. It's a flight simulator, but okay. It's not really a flight simulator. It's a green and blue simulator. So, and I've put, it's a flight simulator where literally nothing happens. Nothing. So the controls are, you are presented with a flight simulator and you have to fly to areas of areas on the map to fight things and shoot things, other airplanes and stuff. And so you can press M for, M for map and you get your map view. You can press plus for thrust and you can fly around and take off. So you are able to sort of take off and get in the air such as it is, um, and then sort of navigate your way around the map. Now, I have to say, there were locations on this map, but I never felt like, A, I was flying, because once you took <laughs> off and you was in the sky, there was no indication of flying. It was just blue or blue, blue and, green. and green, and that's all it was. You got the sound of a kind of a thrusty sound, but there was no nothing moving on the screen, nothing. So it was just nope. static. So it never felt like you were doing anything. So I never felt like I was flying, which meant B, I never felt like I was actually doing anything in the game. Now, I <laughs> I had this bought for me. Actually, this is a real bona fide oh, no. Sunday best. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, dear. I got this bought for me by my, my beloved Auntie Linda. And that's a true fact. Oh, that's, and that's what happened to her hip. <laughs> No, she was a battle axe. You wouldn't mess with my Auntie Linda. She was a uh, A&E ward sister for the best part of 40 years. No one messed with my Auntie Linda. She was a tough cookie. But she bought me this as a present. And it was a really nice thing for her to do up until the point when I loaded it in. And then it was actually <laughs> felt like it was a, the death sentence 
of somebody that <laughs> doesn't understand. I felt like that moment there was a disconnect that was never going to recover from, really. It's just awful, awful case. It's not a fly simulator. It's a, it's, I don't know what you even call this kind of game anymore. We played Acrojet and we played, no, actually, sorry, we played Solo Flight and we alluded to playing Acrojet because it didn't work. But if I'm, and I actually enjoyed that. This is very far from that. And at 199, even at 199, I'm asking serious questions about, is this what people's experience of flight is? No. Are there pilots out there that go, right, let's get in the airplane. Ooh, have we, take, have we taken off yet? Do you mean, well, I, I can hear the sound, but, you know, everything's just kind of blue. <laughs> it worries me that there's pilots out there that might have had their very first, you know, soaring into the sky <laughs> moment on this knobhead bollocks. So, <laughs> uh, awful. <laughs> I hated it. I take, it, I take it you didn't like it. No, I don't. I hated oh, it. And poor, old Auntie, is, poor old Auntie Linda. The only thing that I found a little bit curious was I wonder how long they hung on to the Wing Commander license before it was purchased off them for probably not much and then turned into a much bigger, more expensive game. But there you Yeah, go. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. It's rubbish, isn't it? I mean, I powered up, I took off, I saw some green, some blue, then some darker blue when I flew over the water. Mm. I didn't see much else. Good. I crashed when I ran out of fuel. So then I tried again on Ace. Because when I tried again on Novice, there was nothing. Nothing happened. No other planes appeared. No other enemies appeared. Nothing. It's like, Mm-mm. well, it's just to get me to actually learn how to fly. But the flying is so simple. I don't <laughs> need an entire mode for it. Because then what have I got to do? Just fly around and land? Is that it? So then I tried again on Ace and another plane appeared on the map heading for a factory. So I flew what felt like forever over the island because it was the other side of the island. I was on course. I was about to get it. I saw nothing. The factory got destroyed. And I just went, pow, this, this is boring takes forever to do anything and to get anywhere when you do you can't do anything and you can't see anything i I, I flew literally about you know 20 30 feet off the floor through these what what's supposed to be a factory or on the map that was supposed to be showing something but there was nothing but green like nothing this is this in um acrojet or or solo flight this is if you take ace and take everything out of ace apart from the controls including its aceness (laughs) yeah and the the sense of speed the fighting the 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 mid-air you know mid-air refueling component parts of flying a plane yeah yeah and then just replace it with nothing and go there you go (laughs) well you know it's it's, what we what you've got here is i think ace was 995 this is two quid so what you've got here is a fifth of ace which is about right and and uh, and what you've got is the bad fifth which is the boring fifth it's like the other eight you know the other eight tenths or the other four fifths we, <laughs> the other four fifths of this are the good bits of ace and they've just taken them all out and go yeah. well, what do you expect for two quid yeah you can't afford oh, them no you can't this is this is, this is yeah again aldi ace um, i can't believe it's <laughs> yeah. not ace <laughs> I just think that somebody must have said to them at some point, do you think we should put clouds in that sky and animate them so at least it looks like they're flying through stuff? Nah, no, we don't, nah. Have, we don't have time for that. That's, that would require drawing clouds in, oh. in sprites and animating them, yeah. which on a machine with eight hardware sprites might have looked okay. No, forget that. Too much like hardware. No, we no. Can't, yeah, we can't do that. I've got, no. look, there's, there's a noise happening. Clearly, I can tell they're in the sky. <laughs> yeah, garbage. Wing Commander. Awfulness. Let's move on. Let's move on. Because the next one's good, I think. Our next game, full priced. This is a Sizzler. Sizzles. Sizzler. So what we've got here is that rarest of beasts. We don't see many of these. And I thought we would see more of these type of things, but we don't. This is a puzzle game. This is Split Personalities. So Split Personalities comes from Domark, the home of A View to a Kill, Roger Moore's brown dust adventure. (laughs) God help us. And other and Friday the Thirteenth, so you know a pedigree to build upon. Yes, there's a, the only way is up, as Yaz said. <laughs> it, it really is, and thankfully it is. So split personalities is pretty simple. Okay, so what is it? It's a sliding tile puzzle game. Um, it's, so if you remember Confusion, similar in style a bit. Your sliding tile, you know, you know, you know the sliding tile puzzles that you play. So this is one of those. Except the board starts off empty, and the whole point of this is that you have to reconstruct various faces of nineteen. 19- 80s politicians such as Margaret Thatcher, Gorbachev, Reagan, and whatever. These are randomised at the start, so you don't know who it is you're going to be. You're going to be sort of recreating, but the game starts. It's got a really nice, although relatively short, Dave Whitaker piece of music, which is okay. It sets the tone. It's quite 
quite punchy um gets you going uh into the game there's a, there's a blank board it's sort of the the person you're kind of randomizes and then it shows you that on the left there's a smaller version of what you've got to create so it could be reagan uh, with a background of stars and stripes could be gobshoff with a hammer and sickle uh, and so on and so forth in the top left of the screen there's a box where you move your cursor you kind of have a you have a tile size cursor which you move around the board which takes up most of the screen you move it to the box in the top left and you press fire and that flings a piece out essentially all the way to the far right because what this is is kind of like the uh 23s and 2048 those kind of games when you move a piece it goes as far as it can in that direction so it flings a piece out that can be any piece of the puzzle and you can keep flinging them out as long as you can so then you move on to that you press the fire button down you move in a direction and it flings that piece as far as it can in the direction so you create some space as you bring pieces onto the board you also get sort of bonus pieces um these can range and they're quite sensitive to the person that you are trying to recreate so you might get something that just says tory if it's margaret thatcher you'll get stars and stripes with reagan you'll get the hammer and sickle with gorbachev so on and so forth what you'll also get and so you'll also get its com- com- sort of component piece if you can smush them together you will get extra points bonus points what you'll also get coming on is a bomb and you need to get rid of the bomb now around the edge in the four so top middle bottom middle left and right middle there are sliding panels that open up and close so if you throw something through one of these it goes back into the piles so imagine you've got a pile of tiles in that top left thing it goes back into there except the, the special pieces don't but the pieces to actually make up the puzzle do okay so you want to get rid of the bomb quickly you can get rid of it two ways throw it out or throw a tap at it and that will diffuse it do that mega point that's all good once you start to progress you've also got while all this is going on there is a timer that is constantly counting down so you've got to get a you know you've got to get a bit of a move on um and slowly but surely you pull more tiles onto the board uh, and you move them around you're flinging them about trying to replicate the picture that's on the left when you do that well done level done randomizes get some bonus point you get the next one and so on and so forth and that's this game really it's a tile sliding puzzle type thing with a timer the the main thing you will lose life to is the bomb because it ticks down very quickly and if you can't get it out the out or you can't get a tap to it quick enough you will it will blow up and you'll lose one of your three lives you have three lives if you run out of time or a bomb goes off you lose one of them you lose all three it's game over it's essentially it's an arcade puzzler where you got to get as far as you can and that's it really it's fast it's slick it's easy to understand if anyone knows the tile-based puzzle games and it's good fun there's there's a lot to like here. The visuals are nice. The representation drawings, they're very similar in tone to Spitting Image, uh, which is obviously the political satire program that was on at the time, which we've spoken about before, which was obviously the big sort of big over the top uh, puppet type, not puppets, uh, sort of, I don't know how to describe them really, but big human sized people. Yeah, puppets. Sort of thing, they, they were they, puppets. Yeah, but they, they, were, they were puppets and they were, you know, politically based. And this is sort of riffing on that kind of image of these characters in, in, in a slightly, you know, the, you know, Maggie Thatcher is a bit more toothy, should we say, like like she's in spitting image and, and everything like that so this is what it's going for and that kind of like i said those elements come out like you get a gun come out and there's bombs and there's water and there's all kinds of crazy stuff that will you need to slam together it's just a fun puzzle game that's nippy that's fast that's hard that keeps you on your toes you're constantly up against that time scale of trying to move stuff around work your tiles into the right place like any kind of tile puzzle game i enjoyed this uh i remember enjoying this back then it's 93 percent maybe a little high for what it is but i don't know i don't think it is maybe it's a rat spot on because i think this is a, a puzzle game that is i don't see what you would do to really to improve it really or i really like this what do you think it was okay it wasn't a game that had crossed my radar i'd, I'd heard of it and i'd seen it alluded to a lot and mentioned in a magazine i remember reading the zap at the time and it just wasn't i wasn't really into these kind of puzzle games i quite like games with characters with things to do contrary to what you might think good games with characters and things to do not some of the crap we've had to put it with (laughs) so beer belly burt no uh no no that's um i would rather punch a turd um (laughs) but that said um split personalities i thought you know what let's come at this fresh perspective and everything and it's all right it's not bad it's a good puzzle game it's clever i like the idea of it and it's obviously it's a puzzle game with one of those images that shifts around in little squares and we've all had them for in christmas crackers and all sorts of stuff about you you don't see them now because of you know too many of them ended up in landfill or broken because people tried to rip them apart, you know, and fix them and cheat them. Mm -hmm. And there was a period where every business kind of with logo brand had them made. And anyway, so it's one of those. Uh, I quite like it. On replaying, I found it, it was quite hard, but no harder than any of, you know, harder than some of the other games we've played. I liked the controls. It took me a minute. I'd have to go and revisit the inlay 
just to get the lay of the land, because if you come at this and not quite sure what you're clicking on, then you, you know it's, you're not going to really do very well. You need to understand the format of it all. But mm -hmm. it, yeah. it's a good format when you understand that. You've got to solve the puzzle. You've got all these things happening. It's very arcade inspired. There's no doubt about that. And it's a very likable, challenging puzzle game, which is hard enough to be playable. It's good fun. The graphics are really good, I thought, and work really well, and it's very responsive. The joystick and the controls are nippy, and there's no lag, and there's nothing like that. The sound's passable. It's not amazing, but it's passable enough for the game of this type. Does it deserve 93%? I don't know. Maybe. I think it deserves 93% more than other games that have had 93% did. If you were going to put this in, kind of, if you were going to look at this, it, I, I, well, let me put it this way. If this was Zap circa 10 issues ago this would have been a gold medal but we're in the we're in this new phase of zap where they give ghosts and goblins an unfinished arcade conversion a gold medal and so i don't know all bets are off because this reminds me of the kind of idea that bounder was and bounder was a was bounder a gold medal or a sizzler but I yes can't remember. no it was a gold medal yeah that was a gold medal it was unique it was interesting it had it was different this is unique and interesting it's different there's nothing else like split personalities either in this issue or in the last 10 issues of zap that i recall apart from maybe confusion and that's similar but not the same so i actually on revisit of this finally getting to play it properly and giving it a good go i quite enjoyed it it kept me at it for quite some time it was hard and I, I, and not very forgiving you know I, it made me want to complete that ronald reagan face more than i sh probably ever should with a ronald reagan face <laughs> so i enjoyed it and i thought it was really good it's certainly a better doma game than some of their other trash so this is a good return to form for them and worthy of its price. So I just think it, I have to say it's a sizzler and that's all well and good. Either make this a gold medal because of its uniqueness and all the things that would normally be heralded or keep this as a sizzler, but reduce games that are gold medals that don't deserve to be. That's just my take. Yeah. I mean, my only, the only uh, issue, the thing I had, I just thought was if you had a little bit longer on the bomb timers. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. And that, that's the only thing because it's very, if you, if you get one of them out and you've got no open things and it's that you're done. Yeah. You've got, oh yeah, yeah. It's, you just it's you don't tough. you don't have time no. to so you kind of you kind of almost have to leave two in that top right every time you pull one out. It's in, to get the bombs out in case yeah. you need to fling it out quickly. And oh, I, would, I forgot to say as well, there are electric parts to the uh, to the walls as oh, well. Yeah, they zap it. The, they they zap annoying. it. So if you fling something towards the towards one and there's an electric part, there, it will fling it back the way it came as yeah. far as it can. Bloody annoying. Um, and yeah, they they can be annoying. Yeah, so that's another little mechanic in there as well. And all these mechanics add up to uh, you know frazzle you basically. You're, mm. you're constantly fighting against that timer, and it is it's it's a classic trying to do something in a short space of time and, tr and trying to keep on top of everything and. Mm. Well, while, while doing something fast, while an egg timer essentially just counts down in front of you, and and that yeah. that's that all those kind of things just work to make this a fun, yeah. frantic you know, puzzle game. I yep. think it, I think it stands the test of time. No, no that's argument from me there. Go play it. Yeah, indeed. So that's that. <laughs> Before we head to our cheapest creepers in this section we've got one more game and that game is mission elevator uh it's got another good score 84 mm. percent. so so graham what's mission elevator it's actually quite an interesting game this the context of it all the story of the game the fbi is being blackmailed and part of it is a hostile secret service um, or a central unit of the SBI is controlled by a kind of a hostile part and want to get their own spies out there and free. So they're basically blackmailing the FBI. If you don't do what we say, then they're going to set off a bomb, which they've placed in the floor of a hotel. And you as this particular specialist have been sneaked in to the hotel to try and crack the code of the bomb. Um, but before that could happen and finally deactivate it, before he could do that, went around the hotel and hid small hints for the next agent to be able to go. So you actually play the next person from that person. So you are sent in a, as an agent into this kind of mission. And the idea is you've got to deactivate the bomb, fight your way through all the different floors, of, all the way up to, the, I think, the, I want to say the 60th floor, but up in the 60s, examining everything. Everything has a hint. And then also you're being chased by the different hostile en agents and things in there. So you've got to kind of navigate your way through the lifts and the levels, working your way up, searching things. Does this sound familiar? Going up and down lifts, going into different rooms in a sort of platform environment, searching through objects. Probably should, because it's very mm. similar to Impossible Mission. <laughs> so, and it is it is a it is definite riff on Impossible Mission in its own kind of way. But 
That said, it's actually quite playable and it's actually quite a neat little game. It's not graphically going to blow your socks off, but there's enough in there to make it quite interesting. It's got the balance of difficulty, right? So you can move through the corridors, you can avoid the agents, you can shoot them. And they do kind of a knack of appearing at the most inopportune moments on the various lifts. But you can just get away from and avoid them. And then you've got to examine things. You get keys. You can work your way and unlock different lifts and work your way up the different levels. And, the, and I thought the graphics are okay. And they kind of work well in the context of this game. So they look okay. You don't somersault around. So you do kind of run and duck and you can jump normally and shoot, which obviously you can't do in the Impossible Mission original. So mm -hmm. in this kind of, I said, not a remake, but in this kind of riffing of that kind of idea. So you can sort of go up the levels, go up the lifts, navigate your way, find your way, find the clues, find the keys, unlock lifts, get further up. And obviously you're heading all the way up to the 62nd floor and trying to identify the components of the bomb. I quite enjoyed my time playing this. I, I like Impossible Mission. And so the idea of a game where I'm running around searching for things, looking, avoiding agents, it felt a bit like Mission AD, a little bit. It felt a bit like mm -hmm. Impossible Mission, a little bit. There are a lot of other games in this game. And I've noticed this about a few games in the last a couple of episodes in this one. They're all, there's a theme to them all. Running around multi-level, searching for things. I think in the last episode, there was at least one or two of those sort of games. Maybe there's been more. This isn't a bad one. 84% about right. It was full price. But the graphics were quite well drawn and quite nicely animated. There's enough to go at to make it quite an interesting game. It's a one sitting game, so you better strap yourself in because it's not easy. But it isn't impossible. And, and I think there's more of a clue of what to do and, and progression in this than there is in an impossible mission, which at the end of the day, when you collect all those various items, those <laughs> abstract drawings from the various <laughs> things and have to assemble it into a whatever, at that point, you know, impossible mission becomes very impossible mission. Whereas at least mm -hmm. with this, once you get up there and you've got the component parts, you can finish the game. So I, I quite liked it. It wasn't bad at all. What about you? Yeah. Well, it's actually based on uh, Elevator Action. Okay. Um, have you ever played that? No. Ever seen it? If you look at, if you just wiki Elevator Action now and just have a look at the screenshot, you'll see. So oh, it's, yeah, a 1983, uh, it's a 1983 arcade game. And so that has you moving from the top of a building down to the bottom, which sounds familiar to a script we wrote. <laughs> or a pitch idea we had. Uh, essentially, you've got to collect a load of documents and there's spies and stuff going around it. You go, you move up down via ele elevators and escalators and there's spies who will shoot you and all like that. So this is this is based on elevator action taking. And, and so, but this is obviously in reverse in the way that you're sort of moving up through the level, trying to find keys and trying to find stuff. So there is, there is elements of impossible mission, but I think probably impossible mission has probably taken elements from the original elevator action. And the, the, this is kind of siphoned through that. I think there's definitely some kind of, you know, there's there's probably elements there. So it was made by Tato. It came out for loads of games, Elevator Action. There is a port for the C64, uh, Amstrad, Spectrum, all kinds of stuff. And so this is, uh, yeah, this is a good game. I really liked the visuals on this. Mm. I thought visually it was really quite nice. Not so much you, but those enemies. And they, yeah. they look really shady. They look really <laughs> shady. agents, yeah. Yeah, with, the, with their sort of caps, or their, big, their sort of mm. caps and their hats and their, their, their long coats. It's good. It's okay. My, it's a bit punishing, I thought in the fact of like you know enemies can just pop out from while you're waiting for an elevator they'll just pop out from behind you and shoot you and you're done you're done you're like, oh, i know you've got a lot of lives so about eight or nine lives which is quite decent but they'll go quite quickly when you because you can't move off a bit where you're waiting for stuff and you and you, you you your time to get on the elevator is quite quite limited and i wasn't a big fan of the way you had to search because the only way I could find to search, and I don't know if this was me doing the controls wrong, you had to crouch and then pull in the opposite direction, and then it looked. Yeah, it or was, was I doing? Was, was I... No, that's right. It, it is a little bit awkward, to say the least. Yeah, and so uh, it was okay. That just seems weird when I could just be press the button or push up and press the button or do something. There should be another way of doing this. I don't know. But I suppose when you know when you're shooting and moving and jumping and crouching and all that kind of stuff that you can do, I get that they've got to do different stuff. So uh, the, it should be just crouch and push the button maybe, which would have felt more intuitive. Yeah, it would have made more sense. But I suppose you can crouch and shoot, but does it really matter? Because the... Uh, do the enemies crouch? I never saw them crouch. No, uh, they yeah, do. they do. Yeah, they do shoot low. Oh, right. Okay. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, I think th this is this is a good, interesting game that is quite original. There's not many of this this type. I know you're saying there's lots of these kind of... But done in this style, there are plenty of like Vs and Mission ADs where you're running around flick screen, but this felt a bit different. I like the sort of verticalness of it. Mm. So that you're going up all the time and, the, and it's con conceit of... <laughs> I like someone just blackmailing the FBI. That's quite an interesting <laughs> idea. It's kind of kind of stupid and funny. But yeah, there's a, there's quite a lot to like here, and I think this is a pretty decent and unusual game in respect of what it is. Now, I would say 
that this got in 84% is a little low in comparison to other games we're seeing. Mm. I think this, in comparison to other games we have seen, this is a more complete, complex, fully functioning, working game yeah. that gets that only gets 84%. Interesting. Yeah. But I think this is certainly better than other bigger scoring games, this issue. And I would say that if you're looking for something that's a little bit different, but although you might go play Elevator Action, but this does this is another take on it and Impossible Mission and those kind of games, then this is uh, well worth a look. Yeah. yeah. Anything else? No, nope, no, nope, I agree. Please have something else to say, because if you don't, I've got to talk about Necromancer. No, nope, I think you need to talk about Necromancer. <laughs> okay, well. Good luck, because it's the most confusing weirdness I've come across in some time. <laughs> yeah, well, okay, so <laughs> that was uh, that's the main chunk of games. We're now moving into our cheapest creepers even though Wing Commander was only two quid. Jeepers Creepers, where'd you get those peepers? Jeepers Creepers, where'd you get those eyes? Cheapest Creepers. So the first one is Necromancer. This was three quid. Now the first thing, I'm a huge Rush fan, and Rush have a song on Caress of Steel called, ne- called The Necromancer. And I was very disappointed to find that this game was not based on that song, and it didn't include three travellers fording a river to fight the dread Necromancer. I was not happy. So no, no, this was uh, this is some kind of druid plant them up, and it's just you're weird. right. It, it is really odd. This there's there's three phases to this game, kind of like that Danger Mouse game we played, mm. all of which I found bemusing and odd. The, so the first one sees you in the center of the screen. So you're a druid. You control a will of the wisp, and you can move the will of the wisp around, and you have a number of seeds. You can plant trees. So you've got to plant some trees. And that annoys the necromancer. Um, <laughs> they always do. Well, absolutely. Every necromancer busy, you know, let's, raising the dead. Let's just for a moment pause and remember what a necromancer actually is. And now resume. Yeah, they, they raise the dead. They, yes. they, 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 they do dead magic. Dead they, stuff. You know, dead stuff. So this is you pick, you pick up seeds off purple stuff that moves around you. You move your will of the wisp around because you stand in the center. You don't move. Um, and this will of the wisp that you control will always be trying to return to you, trying to move. So you're kind of just forcing it around the screen in this black screen where these weird sort of hunchback creatures are kind of wandering on, running into trees, kind of, and then turning direction centipede like. It's very odd. It's it's so bizarre. And the, this goes on for a period of time, and then it says, "Well done, you've planted this many trees." You go into the next screen, and I couldn't make any, head and tail of the next bit, so I YouTube the rest. You make your way through the the next thing where you've got to plant trees or get trees through, and there's, you have to crush spider eggs in some kind of platform thing. Yep. And then the third stage sees you in a graveyard where you're finally trying to kill the necromancer in what looked like some kind of berserk meets archon sub battle thing, depth or whatever. Uh, my final comment, because I've got nothing to say about this, because it's so crap, but I felt confused, and, and I was actually a little worried that this game was doing things to me with its flickeriness and oddity, so I turned it off quite quickly. <laughs> um, I felt like I was, I felt like I was like uh, watching a Japanese video about some girl coming out of a well <laughs> that, that that was playing with mine, the and I was going to start seeing so the ring. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> indeed and i was like you know what i'm gonna do the thing what i always say to people in horror films when i'm watching them and turn the damn thing off yes just turn it off stop playing it stop watching it just turn it off and leave you know go get some fresh air and look at the sun <laughs> for a bit and, and feel the freshness of the world on your face rather than spend any more time with this crazy mad thing i mean it's called the necromancer the clues in the name i'm not yes. having any more of this this game is about summoning dead things and i feel if you play it you're going to summon dead thing. Don't play it. No. What did you think? <laughs> God. Uh, so <laughs> I didn't really get that involved with Tetragorn, the necromancer, and his, you know. <laughs> Is that his name? Yeah. I didn't, t- look. Yeah, I didn't, want, I didn't want to know. I felt no it would bring him yeah, closer to me. You control. Your name is Illuminar. You're the wizard Illuminar, and you're fighting the necromancer Tetragorn. And God. that's clearly, <laughs> you know, once the weed had worn off, then they were left with um, this <laughs> this nightmare of a game that they thought of. So, like you say, level one, use your wisp to stop the ogres from uh, in the trees. Level two, grow trees to get roots to crack the evil spider eggs. And then in the final battle in the graveyard, you're finally obviously having a face off with Loom with between Illuminar and Tetragon. So, is it any good? No, it's weird. It's just it's a really strange idea for a game. And again, I'm, I suspect born from someone at some point was sat in a room with a bunch of people and he pulled out a little bag of white powder in a bag <laughs> in his pocket and went, have you seen this? And then afterwards, they all went down some kind of ketamine-fueled 
three hour <laughs> binge and then this was game was the result of their you know, compounded thoughts. Six six months later they woke up in a room they <laughs> yeah, didn't recognise and Necromancer was playing on the Commodore 64 in front of them and they're like, what, what have we done? How did that happen? Uh, this is the product of, of three people in a K-hole. There's no doubt about that. So <laughs> the graphics are basic, undefined weirdness. There's loads going on, I think, but it's all felt a bit cheap and none of it made much sense. The music is a weird medieval style dirge that I've written gradually makes you want to force knitting needles into your ears. So, and that's, that's why my, I turned it off. That's why so, I turned so, it off. Again, and I did the same. I was like, no, no, no. What, 2 99 no thanks. Just bugger I'll do off. a lot for this podcast. You know, with a lot of work goes into this podcast and we do sort of things, but summoning demons and becoming possessed by a haunted <laughs> C64 game is a step too far. I'm sorry, listeners. It's just not happening. You no, know, and I think the only other thing with Tetra that I could think of in it was Tetra Pack, which is the thing that they put milk in, <laughs> isn't it? Milk cartons yeah. made by Tetra Pack. Maybe that's yeah. where this led. Who knows? Who cares? I will never play Necromancer again for as long as I live. Thank you very no, much. Absolutely. That's the end of that. <laughs> you might get resurrected by the Necromancer to play it when you die, though. <laughs> no. What a hell that would be. That is, that is the hell. It's like Hellraiser, that movie Hellraiser. That's That would be that's your <laughs> hell. We go into, in the movie Hellraiser 2, when that guy's in his own version of hell, where there's all them women coming out on those like trays. They're not trays, but I'm just trying to put it in your mind of what it looks like covered in a cloth and then when he pulls the cloth away they just vanish and it's like oh, they promise forever but never deliver that's the that's this game so somebody would go in and go you mean you played necromancer no i'm talking about these women on trays now i'm talking about necromancer <laughs> no. and pinhead would come out and go we're going to make you play this game <laughs> oh, no tears please no tears please <laughs> <laughs> you played the game we came <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's what I feel. This I feel this game was like some kind of portal into a dark, dark. It realm. is, yeah. It's this is the world of you know Pinhead and the lesser Cenobites, you know, Bobblehead, you know, Waggy, chunky. you know, Chunky, <laughs> Plint, Chappy. That's it, and uh, Fuzzy. It was lovely, <laughs> but it was just never appreciated. Chappy, the dog food Cenobite. <laughs> Chappy, yeah, just, his head's just a, trapped in a tin of Chappy. <laughs> 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 just open it it's just that not quite brown meat <laughs> it's like this really hurts because my head's way too big for this tin even though it is a, a bigger tin than the average tin it's still small for a head <laughs> <laughs> there's so much marabone jelly in here yeah, this smells like tripe and that's not a good smell <laughs> no tears please it's a waste of good chappy <laughs> no tears chappy <laughs> The chappy Cenobite. Can you imagine if... Because in, in <laughs> Hellraiser 2, they make a Cenobite, don't they? Dr. Chenard do. gets led into yeah. the Cenobite machine, which up to that point didn't exist, but we'll go with it because it's how Cenobites are made. <laughs> so he gets put in the Cenobite making machine and he gets converted into it. It could have been a whole different move if he came out with a tin of chappy <laughs> on his head. Ah, to think I, I hesitated. <laughs> there's a licensing deal. There's a mislicensing opportunity there. There is. Chappy were, you know. It would have at least made the script more palatable, to be fair. Well, true. Yeah. Terrible. It's kind terrible. of a whole range of uh, whole range of Cenobites based on dog foods. You open the can, we came. <laughs> yeah, win a lot prime it's Cenobite. Just, it's just a dog food. <laughs> oh no. Oh no. Dog food to oh, some. No. <laughs> Pedigree chum to others. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't open the tin. Didn't open the tin. And what was it last time? Didn't know what the tin was. <laughs> Stupid <Felix>. Cenobites. <laughs> oh, dear. All right. So this is what Necromancer did to us. It does. It made us think of Cenotins. <laughs> Chappy the Cenobite. <laughs> right. <laughs> it gets no better. <laughs> it gets no better. Jeepers, creepers. Where'd you get those eyes? Oh, that got forty percent. Our next game got twenty eight percent. Graham, <sighs> uh, our next game is Freak Factory, a Freaky Factory, Freaky something factory. of a factory. So, Graham, what is? What I is don't Freaky know. Factory? I, see, I feel like we're just getting a sea of less than thirty percenters. So, Freaky Factory is one ninety nine, twenty eight percent. You are Agent One of the Galactic Police Force. Oh, oh, of course you are. And you have to go to a big factory to stop the professor who's making gruesome creatures in his five laboratories. So the long and the short of it is this a flick screen sort of side view or slightly side elevated view. Is that what you would call 
quasi 3D. I don't know what you call that. Crap. Um, that's what I call it. Crap. Split into two floors. And you got guess what? You've got lifts, which you go up and down to get between the floors. It sounds, sounds horribly familiar. And mm-hmm. you, the idea of the game is you've got to stop the machines in the lab. And then you've actually got to escape out of the of the whole complex. Strewn across this landscape of doom are the various things, gargoyles, things on the walls that open their eyes. And if you go near them, when their eyes are open, they kill you quite quickly. So you've got to walk across and past them and sneak past things like that. There's loads of that in this game, which if you don't know what the hazard is, is going to kill you very quickly. So, you know, for next time, I hate that kind of stupid game logic. Mm -hmm. And then there's other obstacles like electric barriers and spikes. And I suppose if you're being generous, this is kind of a proto Prince of Persia. Um, But, you know, I'm being very very, (laughs) very generous. But in other words, you have to wander around the different levels, avoiding the obstacles, the things on the walls that, you know, that will kill you until you realise why. And the professor does make the odd appearance here and there on a, some kind of flying machine, which drains your energy if you touch it. And you've got an energy bar, which obviously if it gets to zero, adios muchacho. I thought it was boring with blocky graphics. It's one of those games that slowed down a lot when there was stuff on the screen, which immediately yep. makes me go, no thanks. So, you know, handle your sprite control routines better people just don't do that it just felt as soon as i mean i think it's on the second screen as soon as you have five of the four or five of the stupid um, gargoyles yep. on the wall it's like slow down and you can crawl and try and get past them that way although i still can't get my head around the fact that if you crawl past the gargoyles they still see you and i'm like why then have to crawl it, it doesn't matter <laughs> so i felt maybe aside from the weird blippy the bleak did you notice the music was blippy but it was bleak it's like, I felt like I was slowly, you know, it was a bit like um, listening to Carnival de Animo, you know, the Vangelis one, you know, all the Vangelis music that you know and love is already happy. And then you get to that one, it's like, do, 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 it's bleak. You're like, Christ, what, what was he watching animals being slaughtered live when he made that on his synth? So he sat on a little expensive five grand keyboard, humming away, playing his little tunes while his calves and sheep being stabbed through the neck or something. So I digress massively there. Um, <laughs> The idea of the music being blippy and bleak ties into the game, which makes it feel really morose. So in there, maybe there's a decent idea of a game. I said I say that, but it's derivative of a load of other games like this. So make your way through stuff and avoid the stuff. It just kept, it was tiresome because when you die, you go back to this start screen, which is kind of on this kind of, and you have to sort of walk past this thing that keeps kicking you backwards. I was like, it's so stupid. And, 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 you, and you could just run past it. I don't know why it was even there. It was really stupid. But you ended up at that screen a lot. And I just switched it off at that point. I'm like, now what? Freaky factory. Get nutted. So, done. <laughs> and I'm guessing that you felt the complete opposite from what you've been saying. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A blocky monstrosity of a game it sees you wandering past heads in walls at treacle speed and watching your energy, energy deplete faster than anything. Boring, dull and, u- boring, dull and ugly, and you can use that for the cover. <laughs> and treacle that's it. speed. That's all I, the first treacle, that's, all I wrote. <laughs> that's all I wrote. <laughs> There's nothing else to write. I hated it. No, it was awful. so bad. Every time I got flung back to that thing in that sort of jokey, oh, you think you can run into the thing, do you? Blah, blah, blah. It's like, go away. Mm. I hate you. I hate this whole game. Yeah. I hate the robot version. I hate everything. This is a very, very bad, annoying game. Yeah. I kind of get your Prince of Persia thing. I can, I can see that if I squint. And yeah. look into the middle distance for a few few eyes and get possessed by the necromancer. If, if you were forced to lay an egg and during that <laughs> painful experience, like an ostrich size egg, so it would be really painful. And in yeah. that in that moment of pain where it becomes almost like Cenobite style pain pleasure, sort of yeah, half euphoria, and half, the like euphoria, you, the euphoria yeah. of pain before you realise you've just laid an egg and you you know where well, you've, gonna... well, you've gone past the circumference and now yeah. it's all on the on the, on yeah. the downside. <laughs> exactly. Now it's the yeah. slipping. You've got past the bulb <laughs> and now it's towards the tip. <laughs> Um, when you were at that point. <laughs> oh, see, I think it's thinking of it coming out sideways. <laughs> oh, God. There's, there's no... <laughs> How do you think chickens lay eggs? Painfully. Like, you bad, bad man. <laughs> no, that epiphany, that moment is what I'm saying. Why do you think well. they make that noise? What, the bagark? <laughs> right. Well, I think, to be fair, an egg is an unusual shape, whichever direction it comes out. If you go bulb first it's painful and then it eases off but if it's nozzle first and i'm not sure the tip <laughs> maybe nozzle i'm not sure what the correct egg based name is then you're gonna have to f- you know face the prospect of the bulb and and then, and then if, it, and if it's sideways, sideways on. That's, that's, a, that's that's a wild bulb <laughs> you better hope that 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 you better hope that cracks that egg cracks otherwise you might crack 
<laughs> well, that's what I was thinking about this ostrich anyway. And I was thinking that's still preferable to Freaky Factory. Yes. Uh, this game was dreadful. Awful. I mean, really bad. Uh, just the opening title sequence, I was like, I can't be doing with forced humor nonsense. No. No. It does my head in. It's no. like, just stop it. Yeah. If you've got a game... And yep. the, <laughs> and and you could tell as well that the speeding up stuff. Did you run when you were in the elevator? Yep. You ran dead fast from side to side. <laughs> yeah. And then as soon as you got out, you were like trickle. Yeah. Treacle speed. Treacle speed. It's a, yeah. it's a new it's a new speed. It's uh. It's not a good speed. You know we've had you know seconds per frame, and now we've got treacle speed. <laughs> Optimize your code, we're, people. Optimize the bloody code. We're learning so many things, but anyway, Freaky Factory was crap, and I don't want to talk about it anymore. No end of line. And, yeah, so there you go. That's the uh, first section out of the way. Please stay with us. God, there's is, this is just so much this month. Yes. Uh, we're going to be back in a moment with film and TV from September 1986. So stick around. <laughs> Thanks to our sponsor, DavidHearnWriter.com, where you'll find stories influenced by classic games from the Commodore 64 and Amiga. His next book, Escape from the Commodore 64, is coming soon, when Sarah finds herself pulled into the old computer and hears the words, Stay a while, stay forever. She knows she's in trouble, but at least it wasn't the quack sound from Kane. How will she escape from these robots, and why are they so determined to guard all the furniture? Get the book soon to find out. Visit davidhearnwriter.com, that's David, H-E-A-R-N-E, writer.com, to find out more. Alright, welcome back. Welcome back to the Sideways Egg. Which is the name, just is now the name of a club, which um, Aidy and I have decided exists based on the previous Freaky Friday conversation. Freaky Friday? Absolutely. Was it Freaky Friday? What was it called? Freaky? Freaky Factory. Freaky, fa- Freaky Friday, Freaky Factory. Freaky Factory. Yep. Um, right. Welcome to uh, the Sideways Egg, where we'll be talking about the TV in September 86. Live from the Sideways Egg. <laughs> All right, mate. <laughs> it's squawking chickens. <laughs> <laughs> Crab walking through doors. <laughs> Why do I think um, that squawking chickens would be a, a live act that's going to be on? He's on at 7 p.m. Just wait. Good old squawking chickens. He's a blue singer. <laughs> well, more, woke, more blue woke jazz, up one really. morning. <laughs> woke up one morning. I passed an egg sideways. <laughs> Woke up one morning, da na na na, found I was a chicken, na 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 na. <laughs> so, no one ever told me they come out sideways. <laughs> <laughs> yes, explains why chickens begark. Anyway, right. <laughs> TV, what was going on in TV? 1st of September was the very first episode of long running sitcom Brushstrokes. It went on there on the BBC One. Ah, uh, Brushstrokes, the sitcom I never watched. <laughs> No, it was a sit- it was a sitcom about a house painter. And right, please, uh, the good life, get some in. What's get some in? I don't, I don't know. I meant to. Ask, I've never I heard of ask that. You, is that something? I thought you. I thought it was something you might know. What that was? No, well, I've never heard of get it's, some in. It's written by Esmond and Larby, which is the, right. obviously the writers of Police, uh, Good Life, and all that lot. Ever decreasing circles. Get some in. Like sounds like what you'd say in the uh, sideways egg. <laughs> Our, our new local, yes. <laughs> yeah, we well, stuffed down. He said, "Hey, yeah, Jethro, get some in. Meet, meet at the uh, sideways egg. Get, get some in. <laughs> get some in. Um, <laughs> passing the egg is ever decreasing circles. Yes, <laughs> it is because uh, that's how you measure the uh, the passing of an egg. Well, this this was another one, wasn't it? It was another um, you know working class sitcom. Who was the guy that was in Brush Strokes? I'm trying to picture what he looked like. It was Jacko, wasn't it? That doesn't he help. had sort of. <laughs> I know, but he was called Jacko. I can't tell you. I, I, I don't I, know I, what his I, name was. Well, that doesn't describe him. That's just his name. That's like saying he looked like a Ben. <laughs> he was just—he had a face. He had brown hair. Ah, that's um, not that say no more. It was called Jacko. I don't know. He I'll was just name called that Jacko. Guy in two. But, um, he was a bit, you know. Has he been in anything he, else? <laughs> Not that I can recall. He probably has been in many things, but not that I can recall. He was he was okay. You know, he he was sort of that kind of person you you know who could chat 
girls up around that uh, time. He had that sort of likely dad look like about Terry him. Strong was he kind of a t- Terry, Terry Strong? Terry Strong, type? yeah. Oh, okay, but yeah. So that started. It was in, like I said, it was another working class sitcom. So you had things, you know, it was in the mold of Only Fools and Horses, right. um, Bread. Those kind of you know sitcoms about y- y- your working class character who's but this was a bit you can see it's by the people who did it I mean good life so it's it's a bit gentler it's not as raucous I don't think right um, as as only fools and horses was it was a bit more character I know only fools and horses was character but a bit more I think it was I don't know I didn't watch it I, know, I don't remember much about it and I'm thinking if it's about Peyton decorator it can't be hilarious because there's not a lot of things that you can laugh about is there you painted that wall oh. blue it should have been red. <laughs> There you go. That's, That's it. it. Episode one done. <laughs> right. <laughs> what did we do for episode two? He painted it blue again. <laughs> episode two finished. You painted the cornices. <laughs> episode three, four, and five there. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, 6th of September, part one of The Trial of a Time Lord is broadcast on BBC One. Mac in the return to air of Doctor Who after a 17 month hiatus. Yes. There's many reasons why it had a 17-month hiatus, the least of which is because of the Doctor that returned for the Trial of the Time Lord, which was Colin Baker. Oh, All right, so so was was Colin Baker in there? Was it Colin Baker at this point? It's Colin Baker's was last it? season um, as oh, the Doctor, it? yes. He, famously, the producer of the Doctor Who at the time said, if Colin Baker comes back for the next series, then we're not making it. <laughs> So, <laughs> so he was he wasn't oh. liked by the producers of Doctor Who at all. Of the current that that particular producer, he's he's not my favourite Doctor. They couldn't have liked him that much because they then cast Sylvester McCoy. It's the worst thing that ever happened to Doctor Who. That that thing that everything about that moment when he transformed into Sylvester <laughs> McCoy. It's so horribly wrong. In fact, it actually killed Doctor Who off for a long time. It it was it disappeared for quite some time. In fact, it only came back. For the Doctor Who film, where yeah, Paul McGann, and one. yeah, where mercifully and thankfully Sylvester McCook gets gunned gets. down by a machine gun in the first two seconds, which was like I cheered when I saw that. But um, it's because I I don't like the Colin Baker Doctor Who, and in fact he was actually pretty poorly treated as Doctor Who because he wasn't universally liked by the fans because he was a bit I don't know there was something about him I don't know and and not a proper Whovian, so somebody who is well into Doctor Who will very accurately tell me what was wrong with him. But he wasn't universally liked, uh, certainly not by clearly by the production team behind it, who obviously issued him an ultimatum because he was all set to come back for the next season. And he was told, no, you're not coming back. And if you think about it, we're going to never make it again. <laughs> so it was going to go back was, in time and erase it. So and in doing that, they let in the worst Doctor Who of all time, which was Sylvester McCoy. Yeah. So did, yeah. what's you, this picture you've put? What's this picture right, you've well, posted before, before we talk about the picture, which is of a an enemy. <laughs> That Sylvester McCoy's Doctor Who faces, which is a badly made licorice shell sort man called the Candy Man. Before we even get to that, and that why I hate Doctor Who of that season so much, which is it's essentially I think it's season twenty four, I think, which is just dreadful. I think it's season twenty four, but around that time, which is mad, isn't it? There's twenty seasons of Doctor Who Plus that are actually good till it gets to this point. It reaches a point when a in, good they, subjective. They decided to redo the opening sequence for Sylvester McCoy. So they rebranded, which they, okay, they do that. Change the opening sequence so they add a really weird, like a badly animated gif of Sylvester McCoy winking. I mean, and if that, if that wasn't an <laughs> affront to everything that Doctor Who is, because um, he kind of starts with a scowl, then it fades to him winking, and then it's kind of a knowing smile. It's not a good thing to happen at any point. Everything you need to know about that, and then there's the image. That is a that's the best of the enemies that that doctor faces. It is a, a man with a licorice all sort head and a <laughs> and a coconut licorice all sort body. It's a licorice all sort man, and it's a it's crap. <laughs> it's like I've I've made one of those out of cocktail sticks and a licorice all sorts when I was quite drunk, and it was better than that and more realistic. It's just it's so bad. It it beggars belief, and I think you'll have to make sure you post that to the Twitter or to the okay. So the thing because it needs to be seen because people need to know what happened. Um, <laughs> people and then, need to know. They do the guts because, to know. <laughs> you know, everyone raves about the, there's one episode of the Sylvester McCoy Doctor Who where he famously confronts a Dalek and it actually floats up the stairs for the first time ever, answering the lifelong question of why. How do they get? How do they get the stairs? Yeah. And so it answered that. That is the only thing in that entire run of doctor who episodes which is even remotely interesting the rest of it is so shambolic and poorly funded and badly made and badly budgeted and ends up with that bloody licorice all sort man that it makes <laughs> makes me angry even looking at it 
So <laughs> that and, just makes me question life choices. And then, and then I thought but. to myself, you know, I thought maybe I'm being unfair on Sylvester McCoy because maybe he was just dealing the hand that he was dealt with the Doctor Who material. And then he turned up in that bloody Lord of the Rings movie, the Hobbit movie, whatever it was. And he was crapping that. Playing Radagast. some kind of twitchy, Radagast, the brown, twitchy, flutter his eyelids, talks to animals. Just why get him to do it? Anybody but him. I'd have done it. Just, you know, you know, you didn't, you, you didn't look at me at the time. I'd have done a better version of that. I can make a cocktail stick, bloody liquor short sort monster, and I can also do a better Radagast than that clown shoe. So, no, anyway. It's, it's all it's all history now. I'm over it now. It's a bit like when <laughs> Nigel Tufnell's folding his bread in Spinal Tap. You know, it's, I'm above it. I rise above. <laughs> but um, Open your heart to <laughs> me. Just, do you know what? If all of the episodes, every episode of Doctor Who is now on Britbox, everything. all mm-hmm. And there's some amazing episodes of Doctor Who in its early, early days. And they really are. Mm-hmm. And then it gets better and better. Then it kind of goes through a lull. Then it gets better and it goes through a lull. And then that happens. And then it, it didn't really recover from that until until much later on when you got the more recent you t- Doctor t- You told me that that... that I mean, it's not bad, but you told me that that sequence where that stupid robot kills all those Cybermen was amazing. Yeah, and it is in the context of Doctor Who. You know, imagine if it was that liquid short sort guy doing it. <laughs> I think I prefer that because that <laughs> robot was stupid. The Rascalon robot is the, or the Rascalon warrior, whatever it is. That's it's <laughs> it's good because you at least you're at least seeing the horror of because he just blatantly chops that Cyberman's head off, doesn't he? He's like, bah! It's <laughs> yeah. just brilliant, <laughs> and it's quite violent for TV. You know, it, it was it never was that again. It, the Sylvester McCoy Doctor. Through is a, a weak thing anyway. I won't go on about it. I feel like I've rambled on crazy on it, but just avoid it. You have. Next week on Graham Opens His Heart. <laughs> Next week on Doctor Who, <laughs> Anonymous. Uh, right, what else happened? The first, on 6th September again, this was a big night. The first episode of medical drama Casualty airs on BBC One. Although an immediate success with viewers, the show attracts controversy because of its portrayal of an underfunded National Health Service, which is seen as a criticism of Margaret Thatcher's government. Oh, oh God. Of course it is. You know, I, my nickname for casual is actually, I call it causality. Because it <laughs> cause, is... It, cause and effect. It is, because it is like watching a mini mini TV light version of Final Destination. Because each week some <laughs> horrific sequence of events, unavoidable events happens, and someone's going to end up in bloody hospital, aren't they? Being nursed by Charlie and the rest of the Girl crew. Charlie. Charlie. And he's yep. in it right to the end episode, I think, as well. But Charlie. And then, yeah. and, and my auntie, the same auntie that bought me Wing Commander, Stranger, was actually a nurse. She was a, a nurse in A&E, a, like a sister, ward sister, for 40 years plus, until she passed away. Uh, amazing woman. And she absolutely loved Casualty. Whenever I mentioned it to her, she always made a point of going, it's not like anything like reality. It's nothing like that. <laughs> no, <laughs> was like, oh, well. So what is it like then? And of course, I mean, I've been to hospital in... in as you do over time, and it's nothing like that at all. But because um, there's actually no. nurses and doctors that attend to your wounds and injuries in casualty. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! No, you don't get. You don't tend to get so much of that nowadays. You know, but they are doing an amazing job uh, with COVID, so all bets are off. Indeed. Yeah, casualty was a weird one. There's always the there was the Holby there always, City like, one the, that came the, after that as well. Holby City. There were the there were the big event episodes where they were not Ooh, just yeah. We just go. We could just go full Final Destination. It went just full on. Yeah, like. Soap towering opera. inferno or something oh yeah there was uh, there, there were, i think there was one point when a gunman took over the hospital you know i think someone a, someone planted a bomb in an ambulance a bit like that movie speed yeah loads of crazy stuff nonsense. like that yeah mad 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 yeah mad all right also this is it's all the same day british television premiere of stanley don and science fiction thriller saturn 3 on bbc <laughs> one that was certainly a night on bbc one wasn't it saturn Trial of the time or casualty and saturn saturn 3 saturn 3 I don't. I don't know if I've ever seen Saturn Three. You know, <laughs> well, I'm not I, sure. I, I think something. I probably have. I bloody well have. <laughs> I know you have. It's right. It's, this is this is so far in your oeuvre, in your wheelhouse that it's it could be made for you. <laughs> Saturn Three is is mad. It's a mad film. It's mad in so many ways that, and that is what appeals to me. Exactly. So, I mean, it's a it's a story of a a military guy that steals a robot an ai based robot and attempts to and goes to like a, a sort of a, a base for what like a, a off world base like a hydroponic center really and at that point is i'm not sure really what his goal is because it's never really explained but i think he wants to merge his conscience with the robot and become like a super being or something anyway it all goes characteristically wrong and he ends mm-hmm. up um tr- you know the two people that are on this hydroponic center which is bizarrely 
Farrah Fawcett and Kirk Douglas. Just <laughs> like the most random cast. And there's the angry soldier guys played by a very young Harvey Keitel. I mean, just what? The casting agent went, do you know what would make a great sci-fi movie? Farrah Fawcett, Kirk Douglas and Harvey Keitel. That's who. And a robot called Hector. So anyway, long with the shot of his. <laughs> <laughs> guy, guy builds the robot. The robot goes a bit crazy because he's merged his mind with it. He has horny thoughts about Farrah Fawcett, who wouldn't. And then, of course, all hell breaks loose. The film was plagued with problems, the least of which is that it was made by the same company that was making Raise the Titanic at the time. And as you could imagine, Raise the Titanic turned out to be a massive expensive flop and they ran out of money with it. So Saturn 3's production was limited, to say the least. Um, mm-hmm. All of the actors fell out completely with the directors and writers, all of them. In fact, a friend of Javier Keitel's is quoted, the actor is saying he hated everything and everybody on that film. <laughs> oh, wow. And he, because he hated it so much, he refused to take part in any post-production audio redubbing of his own voice because they didn't feel like he's, he'd done it very well at the time. So they ended up dubbing over the entirety of Javier Keitel's voice um, with the British actor Roy Dotrice, who is actually the guy that plays Mozart's father in Amadeus, randomly. So in amongst all of that, the production values were kept kind of high-ish. So it's all based on one set, all very limited. The robot itself is actually quite cool. The sound design's quite nice, the film. It's got its good moments in it, some quite gruesome and horrific moments in it. The least of which is Kirk Douglas, who at this point must have been 75, getting his giddy on with Farrah Fawcett. It's like a bit, it's like, uh, you're getting that whole... It's going to be exploding dust thing again. Um, so, but there is some boobs in it, which are all right. It's just, I'm surprised it's taken that long to get on BBC TV because it's not like it's a new film in any respect. It's not brilliantly old, but it's certainly not new, new. Um, I just think it's interesting that it was this big British television premiere of some, it's the amazing Stanley Donnan. Is it? Well, it's not really amazing. It's not, it's not. What they call great. Uh, there's no. some ro- really ropey effects in it, to say the least. The robot was good. Enough. Well, when was it made? It was the 70s, wasn't it? Yeah, I think I ain't written the year down. I think it's 19, late 70s at some point like that. Yeah. So, but again, I think it was written long before that and then went through a oh, it's massive 19, series 1980. Of All right. So it's. It, it's, it's but, been, so it, it would have been probably made in late 70s. Yeah. yeah it, 879. And it was 80. it was written and rewritten and rewritten by different people and the script was rewritten and reworked. And it just, and like yeah. these films do, it became something that it wasn't. And funny enough, I watched this about two weeks ago because it is quite an interesting film, Saturn 3. It's up there with a few others, like it's a bit like a film Android, an early film with Klaus Kinski in and a few others that are just generally oddball films to watch. So go and watch it. Yeah, they are. Go and watch it. You, you watch okay. it, Mr. Mills. Go and watch Saturn right, 3 I'll immediately. Give... Immediately. All right. I will give that a view in if you give this film a view in. Because on the 19th of September, from today, Channel 4 started showing the Red Triangle stuff that we mentioned last time. At the start of and during films with adult themes. And the first use of the warning is for the film Themrock. Themrock? Themrock. Which aired at 11.30pm. Uh, it lasted a year. So lobbying from newspapers and pressure groups, this method of identifying such material was phased out within a year. So Themrock, as you've noticed here, is a film with incest and cannibalism. Oof. <laughs> um, but I've got the uh, the cast of Themrock up here. So we've got Michel. This is a ni- it was a 1973 French satirical film by Claude Feraldo. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the characters in it is Marilla Toro, who who plays Superior Shapely Secretary. I'm in. Count me in. I'm watching that. <laughs> there you go. Kalouche plays the male neighbour, and Mew Mew is the young neighbour. Oh, okay. Mew Mew. Yeah, Mew Mew. I don't know who that is, but let's have a look. Who's Mew Mew? Oh, she's a, she was born Sylvette Henry. Uh, anyway. Oh, Sylvie. <laughs> yeah, people French. But there you go. So so it got all weird, you know, and as you put, Mary Whitehouse was not impressed. No, she probably wasn't. That's a great picture of Mary um, Whitehouse, though. It's the only picture of her laughing. She was laughing as something was banned. Well, and it looks contextually like she's, she's hot there's an egg. Just poking up the top of the picture from the bottom. <laughs> so it's not sideways though. It's not a sideways egg. But that's, well, that's maybe where she was headed. But you have to put, again post the picture in the in the notes, the show notes, so people can get a full flavour of that. Oh, okay. I'll post it on Twitter. I don't think pictures show up in show notes. I'll put it on Twitter. There we go. That's your TV. What have we got in films? Well, there's some big films. There's some whoppers, <laughs> doozies. So the first film, the twelfth of September, we had Day of the Dead. Oof. So the third in the Dead trilo- the original Dead Trilogy from George A. Romero. Mm. And I would argue the, the best. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, I know a lo- I know. there's a lot of appreciation for the day. Strangely enough, uh, just as an aside here, I'm just going to say this, If when you listen to it, it might not be on there, but uh, Argento's cut of Dawn of the Dead is on Amazon Prime. Is it really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. I know. 
That is interesting. I just sort of flicking through the thing through the other day, and it was Dario Argento. Slightly better Dawn soundtrack. Um, weird. And a weird few thing. extra scenes in there, aren't there? So it's always interesting. Yeah. Dawn of the Dead isn't a bad movie in of itself. It's just very, very dated. Yeah. I mean, I, I quite like some of the bits in Dawn of the Dead, and obviously it has its, you know, what it's saying. But I think just Day of the Dead is just a better film. Yes. Um, it's not the film. Obviously, we know it's not the film that Romero wanted to make. Budgetary restraints led it God. to what it is, and but it's it's very gory. It is stupendously <laughs> the, obviously gory. the the ridiculously uncut one. It's very very gory. There's lots and lots of grew in that one, isn't there? But mm. it's um. You know, if you're gonna, and there's some, it's a shame about some of the effects. I mean, obviously that the the faceless, the mouthless zombie at the beginning can barely see and things. Mm. The classic shot of the hands coming through the wall and the most over dramatic turn in the his, his, uh, history it is. of all that cinema. That was the trailer. Remember the trailer that was in the trailer. It's such a good trailer and teaser it trailer. It's dramatic, um, and, but it's and uh, you know, Rhodes is <laughs> kind of funny. Mm. Um, but it's a bit overacted uh, to some oh, degree. Completely, but you know, <laughs> it's, it's a film that's over the top in every direction so it's it's understandable because he, he's going he's only as outrageous as the visual effects yeah i guess um yeah, yeah boob and everything it's fun go i mean it's it's it, i don't know I, I haven't watched it for a while sort of thing so i'm not even sure if it actually stands up as gory these days oh it is everything everything we've seen and it is tv and stuff i mean if you watch some, some scenes in the walking dead it's like yeah yeah compared to uh, yeah i don't know walking I think, dead is horrible in places horrible yeah, it is and i don't know i suppose it sets it's a setting the benchmark movie isn't it for that kind of the the kind of zombie yeah. thing um it's the first movie where zombies are dealt with en masse um because even though in dawn of the dead you, there's an inclination of that you don't really see it because of obviously the restrictions of casting at the time is that you know they're just lots of blue faced yeah. people wandering around this is the first time when you get a real sense even though it's even even it still is in a small way there's a real sense of the scale of the problem and that they're yeah. hopelessly out of their depth and i really i really really like that and, and i mean without giving spoilers away because you know we're the years later now but the hopelessness that they're in leads to them just making a hopeless choice and and i yeah. and i think it's a film that sticks to its guns and still does and i think it, it's the one of the if not the greatest zombie movie ever made because i don't know of any others that really have the same impact I, even when i watch it now there's moments that have a real impact with you um the moment when you know he decides he's, he's had enough the moment when they're all all the zombies break out and again i know there's the budget limitations of the film start to show later don't they um when you start seeing the same zombies wandering around sort of you know, a lot yeah, and you know, and, and the film loses its way a little bit from its genuinely brilliant first and second act, so where it kind of just becomes a bit lost at the towards the end, and it's not as good at the end as it is in the build up to that moment when the zombies break into the military complex. After that, it sort of gets a bit. It's not as good, even though it's much more gruesome when people are being torn apart and all the rest of it. But I think the build up to that, finding out about. Um, the evil, not the evil doctor, but the doctor's, you know, what he's been doing and the, his research and the, the hopelessness of everything. I find that fascinating about that film. And it is genuinely horrific. It's the, when there is gore in it, it is horrible. Yeah. <laughs> in a Eerie. way that none of the other Romero films were ever that gory again, I don't think. The zombie films, I don't think any of them are. No. Well, the, the second trilogy is not very good, though, is it? No, because you've got Land of the Dead, Diary, Diary. of the Dead, and then diarrhea of the dead is it and then <laughs> egg of the dead <laughs> egg of the dead Side, sideways, sideways egg. Egg they, of get the dead. they get trapped in the sideways egg like yeah the wind, you should make the, like egg, the egg trilogy yeah and the the great the i mean I, i've read a lot about like you've land, like you said land, land of the dead land of the, the dead and there's a, another one it's not, isn't it's there? not twilight is it i don't know there is another one though isn't there i mean I've, like you have uh read about his ambitions for day of the dead and about this idea that they were going to militarise the zombies and all that stuff. And I'm glad they didn't do that for this. I'm glad that they just alluded to that thought and that they hinted that that was a, the only way that they could really hope to deal with it is to actually just kind of utilise them as some kind of slave labour or whatever. And they didn't expand it into this bizarre Romero idea because it just wouldn't have worked because he was not capable of films of that scale and grandeur and that's been proven uh, mm. you know with films with bigger budgets that he had survival just... of the dead is the last one that's it and th none of them are any nowhere near as good as day of the dead um and dawn of the dead's okay but it was 1970 what 77 78 so yeah. it's very yeah, I, I, very I, of I, its time now now the I, dead, that's a different ball game that's a brilliant film in its own right so yeah absolutely yeah yeah groundbreaking yeah, the, in the, the... every direction and and day of the dead in its own way is too yes yes it is proper 18s now we don't get them anymore do we really? 
Because they're all on telly. They're all on TV. See if it's because that's what and the knock on effect of the on the, Netflix. The, you know, the knock on effect of things being so gross on TV and all the rest of it and The Walking Dead and everything else, which these films paved the way for, and we joked about as teenagers going, "There'll never be anything that gory on telly." Now it it means that it's so soft brush. And the irony of Mary Whitehouse's image being on that page with Day of the Dead, the irony of it is that Day of the Dead is nothing anymore. I think it would probably be a PG if they released it. You know, if this was a eight, proper 18 rated adults only violent, gory film. And, and cut to shreds of her ear as well. Yeah. And now it would be a 15, probably at a push, maybe a 12. You know, may contain scenes that may trigger you, you know, warning at the beginning. There you go, done. <laughs> Because it's just nothing now, and I, and isn't it? It's just mad that that's the case. But there we are. Um, go watch there Dawn. Are. Go watch Day of the Dead. In fact, I would say go and watch Night, Dawn, and Day because they're not a bad old films, even in the sequence. And yes, there's a bit ho- a bit of hokiness here and there. They do hold up very very well, and they are great zombie movies. And then after that, go and watch the Lucio Fulci ones, and then just have a real good laugh because those are so <laughs> shit. <Yeah. laughs> Which one? The Beyond? Oh, beyond the uh, flesh zombie, eaters. zombie Flesh Eaters or whatever it was, Zombie City, 2. The, City of the Living Dead, House by the Cemetery. Yeah, just watch any of those. I mean, Zombie Flesh Eaters is his most complete Fulci movie, isn't it? And it is, out of all Maybe. of them, the one that's leaning leaning most on Day to Slash yeah, it is. Dawn of the Dead. I think my, my, the one I actually prefer out of all is The Beyond. Yeah, and you see a lot of people say that, but the Beyond is just incomprehensible, and it has four-legged floating spiders. Oh, absolutely. It has everything but, a film needs. But at least with Zombie Flesh, it is, you know, it's always good to see a film that takes the goriness to the extreme that that one does, you know, eyes being poked out on wooden sticks, and yeah. people having their throats bitten out, and there's the peekaboo zombie in that as well, which always makes me laugh, where he just <laughs> peeks into that wooden thing, and then hits him with a face with a shovel, and you get that kind of crazy crackings. Go watch that as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's day of the dead 12th september that came out uh a week later you could go and see the sequel to the much better film uh poltergeist 2 uh mm. came out that was direct sequel because it uh obviously followed on directly followed had on. the same family yeah, yeah. same family same pretty class. much i um, remember it's... so little about it i must go and watch it again well it has the uh reverend in it doesn't it who's actually there's the one crazy really really creepy scene where he turns up at the uh, doorway and he starts ranting at them and that's oh, a really really right. good scene that is but the rest of the film is a bit of a mishmash it's mm. um it's not as good yeah i mean it's a sh- shame what happens obviously to both heather Ray Rourke and the sister as well they're, they're both I didn't know they're obviously spawning the myth of the curse of the poltergeist films and what have you but whatever you do do um do do don't watch the remake of poltergeist no because the remake of poltergeist is so bad it's, it's so bad awful. if you're gonna if you're gonna watch poltergeist just go watch the original because i watched the original recently and that film still the original stands is up. good it is it's brilliant it's so much good stuff in that film it's so weird mm. it's got a real off kilter vibe to it um which is this kind of uh rift between obviously toby hooper and spielberg and you can kind of see these two mm. things pulling in different directions and they lead to these really weird scenes like the sequence in the first film Poltergeist 2 is all right but it's nothing like the first film the f- like the bit sequence in the first film where he he gets that scratch on his face and ends up pulling his entire mm. face off and it's gross yes and then it's just and it's weird and this yeah uh, so uh, the first one's great Poltergeist two is okay, but three is a waste of space. Yeah, no. So don't watch that. Um, that was that came out the nineteenth September, twenty sixth September. We had Hunter's Blood. So again, I might put the post this. I remember that video case. Yes, I uh, when I posted I saw it in it. there when I when I saw it, I was like, I remember that when you used to work in Blockbuster. I remember that on this on the shelves. Yeah. So this is some, um, you know, it's a as you put riffing off Deliverance. Yeah, southern comfort. Southern comfort. It's a load of as you put red and exploitation. I think that's a good title, good, yep. good word for it. Uh, I, I don't think I ever watched it. Interesting that it's got John Travolta's brother in it. Yeah, Joey Travolta. Joey Travolta, who does, was in yeah. Amazon Women on the Moon, as you've yeah. noted here. Yeah, he plays Butch in Amazon Women. That's, that's Joey film, Travolta. Yeah. yeah, so there's a nice link. <laughs> yeah, there is. Yay! But hey ho, because on the same day, yeah, you could have gone see Hunter's Blood, or you could have made the right choice and gone see Aliens. Yes, um, that's probably so, arguably the right choice between Hunter's Blood <laughs> you know, and Alien and you know Deliverance esque uh, film and this, and probably one of the best sci fi war films ever made. Yeah, uh, I, think, I don't think anyone's going to argue with that. Yeah, so 
you've got lots to take in here. Let's go. Let's go aliens. What well, are we yeah, going to say about aliens? I mean, because I think this is probably going to be the only alien film we're going to get to talk about. All yeah. the rest are too far apart. I think so. Um, and it's the best one. It's the, yes, by, it's, the, yes. it's a logical progression from Alien. It's a good progression with the same enough characters from the first one to continuation. The idea is sound. The logic of it works. The idea that they send in a military team to figure out what happened to a colony and all the, all, the whole premise of Aliens and the idea there of there being more than one in the title. It's just, it's clever marketing. It's cleverly thought out. It's a really good script. The effects are good. It's a brilliant casting choice. It's, it's a great film in every respect. It's a really good film. Mm -hmm. And I think the problem is it set the benchmark so high for the sequels of Alien that no other Alien film ever got close to being as good. Not not a single one. Not no. in, because it, it just never got as good as Aliens again. Well, uh, and they the, tried. The thing is, it's not just it's not just Aliens. It's not many films get get <laughs> get close to this. No, it's. I mean, in in many ways, they, it's just one of those things when a perfect series of things comes together. So you've got a really talented, young, special effects savvy, you know, brilliant set designer, special effects creator, artist, visionary James Cameron, who wants to make, you know, these kind of movies. He's off, fresh off the back of Terminator and a number of other stuff. So he's, he's wanting to do this film and knows exactly what it's going to look like in his mind. And he's, there's a clear influence of other films that he's made leading up to this point. If you watch enough James Cameron movies, as I'm sure you have, you see that kind of legacy in them, don't you? You see that look of the sci-fi-ness. If you look at Galaxy of Terror and a few others where he did the effects, you can see the build-up to this. And all of the world of the aliens and the world of the military in it is such a brilliantly believable world, so well thought out and just instant, that you just you don't question any of it. You just buy it. Okay, there's this army that go around hunting aliens on the and they check this stuff out. Just, you just totally take it on board that that's... And yet this is completely unique. Nothing had happened like that in films up to this point. Alien and war, you know, alien war movies just didn't exist in this way. And so it just mm. brought that freshness. The camera work was really on point with this. That just an amazing moment when they're looking for the columnists inside of that um, tower and then the aliens stop land on them and kill everybody. And it's just a brilliant film in every respect. So my question there was there's a lot to there's a lot of questions around aliens two things i would ask you firstly what your take is on the extended version because i actually personally don't like it i have to say after a long period of battling with it and secondly do you think that aliens was ever going to be any good afterwards was there ever anything that came close well in the, in the franchise yeah because there's loads of more aliens and aliens predator and there's tons of eight yeah, movies with aliens in after this i'll answer the first question obviously yeah no, nothing is good i mean the next best one is the the director's cut of Alien 3, mm. which is in the, the... Obviously, you can probably get online or somewhere, but it's actually available in the quadrilogy box set it's david fincher and i'm a huge david fincher fan mm. i think he's, a, he's an incredible director very much so. um very very clever and alien 3 i think was his first full feature length film mm. and i think there's, there's there's many problems with the cinematic version the cinema release of alien 3 which i didn't mind because i liked the way it was directed but upon rewatching you see a lot of issues with it and it's not as good and the problems are more with the production rather than the direction the special effects and things like that the, the director's cut makes a hell of a lot more sense the alien comes out of an ox there's a lot more plot development there's a lot more character development and still some a few issues with some of the special effects but i actually really like alien 3 it's not as good as aliens no aliens is still the definitive one but i think alien 3 is the director's cut is it stands with the first two in my opinion I really do. I think it's. I think it's a a good continuation because again, I think it does. Alien Three could have just done more, more of Alien Aliens. Mm. Instead, it simplifies it back down to a you know a, a weird sort of penal colony. And there was and obviously there was massive amounts of problems with the production of that with Vincent Ward's Wooden Planet and all that kind of crazy mm. stuff. So post Alien Three, now nah, it's all crap. Yeah, pretty much. Prometheus is rubbish. Covenant is pretty crap. Probably the best one of the lot. Alien Four is nonsense mm. um, or resurrection or whatever it's called the aliens versus predator films the second one's all right because it's really gory and stupid but the first one's crap it has been a slow steady decline across the alien franchise so no there's not been anything since no. do i think the extended version uh, is as good no i watched them both recently and the director's cut is tighter faster paced and works there's nothing wrong with it. And the additional scenes, you know, which had, uh, oh, look, sentry guns. and mm. but It's just a lot of sentry guns going off and mm. shots of aliens blowing up that we see elsewhere. And the 
the shoehorning in of the mother subplot in the opening sequence actually kind of dilutes the mother subplot of finding Newt. Yeah. For me, you get enough information, and and I don't think you need what goes on in that opening. You know, with the seeing pictures of a of an old woman who she's told that that's a dead daughter. No, it's it just, terrible, it, and her acting's awful in that bit as well. Yeah, it just doesn't work, and there's extra other bits. But no, I, I prefer the the cinema release, the cinema cut is the the one I always watch now. It's not that I don't like the director's cut because mm. it's still Aliens. It's just it's a, it's just a bit more flabby. Aliens cinema release is perfect it's just perfect it's you know i i there's not many films i walk away from going i don't know what you would do with that to do anything better it just works perfectly no and it it defined what the military in space looks like i think even till now i don't think i can't think of a film where they don't look kind of like that well if you if you i mean you've played halo Mm. that opening sequence to halo oh yeah it borrows it borrows so heavily (laughs) on aliens it's almost you know, it's almost litigious. <laughs> yeah, I mean, even the still the idea of you know drop ships, troops on drop ships falling, someone falling asleep, and them all well, a, kind a, of camaraderie a, and chatting. That, that still is existent to this day. Yeah, Johnson is apone. Yeah. You know, the, ah, wake yeah. up, ah. and it's also the other thing with aliens as well is it possibly the most eminently quotable film ever made. <laughs> yeah, one of them. Yeah, and it's just a bit. There's so many lines in that film. Goodness me, it's just ridiculous. And it yeah. also, it's not just not just that version is quotable, but the ITV cut is also eminently quotable. Oh yeah, because they didn't they edit the dialogue badly. And... Oh, loads of it, so much they edited loads. They took out all the swearing and just replaced mm. Ripley's voice with someone else. Um, oh, that's is, you know... Do you see them frigging each other over for a percentage? Yeah, frigging. It's so good. No, I hope you don't, because yeah. that's rancid. It'd be worse than them doing anything. <laughs> no, there's, there's so Aliens is almost a perfect film, and there's I've seen a lot of writing around it. How it's like it is the perfect action film, it's the perfect war film, is it sci-fi? Who cares? It's just a perfect film. Yep. And and I think Cameron coming into this as he did on the back of Terminator, and it's cheaper. I don't think it cost that much to make, did it? No, I think um, it's comparatively. In the grand scheme of things. No, and it not compared um, to the return. Goodness me, no. Yeah, it's but and it's um budget was eighteen and according to IMDB is estimated eighteen and a half million. It's not a lot for um, a film like that. No, it's gross US and Canada was eighty five million, gross worldwide hundred and thirty one. I'd imagine that's way, 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 way higher these days. Oh, with be in the DVD, Blu rays and, and everything. So yeah, it's it's a, it's just one of those films. I think it is just now it's so iconic. It's but it it has it did set I I think you're right, it set that military in space. Mm. So so um strongly that it's arguably one of the most influential pieces of media to influence other media yeah that, that was ever made you're right and i think even even something as simple as the sound design of aliens so the sound of the machine guns when they fire them the aliens being gunned down and that kind of machine gun fire sound and and just the sound effects of aliens are you know take that into any of the starship troopers movies or anything it's just you know it's very aligned they're all very aligned to a kind of look yeah. and feel about the military in space and i think it's because he set that believable benchmark. I mean, even one of the Blade movies kind of rips off the alien troops idea, doesn't it? I mean, they're not aliens, but they're kind of the camaraderie between the troops and the way they talk to each other, and each one's got its own kind of character and Hicks and Blade the Hudson, two. where they've got like the you know the army of vampires that were originally trained to kill you know the Blade and all that nonsense. But the idea yeah. of that, and it's maybe, I mean, if we probably, if you really looked into it, that might, that idea of that might be borrowed from God knows what films, but. Well, probably things like Magnificent Seven and stuff, I guess. Yeah, and... to some extent. And, but I just think from, from my perspective, as a very impressionable teenager when Aliens came out, it still is a film that I, I easily in my top action movies of all time. It's just, it's just stupendously good. We've not even mentioned, this is a, another clever thing you were saying about building, how it built upon the first one. So from one alien to multiple aliens and everything, you know, from Ripley being on her own and thinking to all the, gr- all the, the crew and everything. The way it took the technology... The, the, you know the small sequence in the first one where Dallas is in the pipes oh, the and they have the and they have the tracker and how it incorporates that and builds upon that and uses that in a way that is quite incredible. Mm. You know, ten meters, nine meters, eight meters, and do 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 do, and the rising yeah. tension from that beep getting closer and louder and yeah. closer. And it's like you're not reading it right. They're in the room. And, and everything about that sequence is builds upon that sequence from yeah. the first film, and 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 manages to not feel like oh, it's just ripping that bit off, but yep. turns it into something, you know, oh, they've all got their own personal trackers now, because of course they would. It's 57 years later. Yep. That technology has moved on, and they've got the, 
it's, it just utilizes iconography and ideas mm. from the first film and you to push you know makes them oh this is the evolution of that tech yeah and makes them believable so much so that you know how many games have been influenced by that tracker and oh. alien tracker countless yeah yeah you know and yeah. that idea of having that kind of personalized radar and the idea of being overwhelmed with all the things surrounding you it's just it's become it's it was you know this is the film that put all those things in motion you know, yeah. The idea of taking a squad of people into a situation, one of them having a big machine gun, one of them having a small machine gun. You know. Even the film, even the game Alien Breed on the Amiga owes a lot, well, everything to yeah. Aliens, let alone Warhammer 40k and all the gene stealers or whatever they're called in the end, the Tyranids or whatever and all of that. You know. Alien Syndrome and things yeah, like that. This, this just, you know, it, it permeated through a lot of things. A very important yeah. film, Aliens, in many, many ways. And of course, and the-, the tragedy is behind all of that that there was never a decent c64 game of it well i don't know we've got to play aliens yet so yeah we'll, when we get there we'll see we'll remember we'll remember <laughs> it's got to be better um, than the alien it, game we played it, in old episode one was it goodness that was terrible and it also it also introduced the terms now xenomorph xeno yep. thing and that that became a thing looking through um camera and stuff on imdb right now interestingly his first um his first thing in his directorial stuff is a fil- is something in 1978 called Xenogenesis. Yeah, tell you, which I've never heard up, of. Building up to which aliens is, for some time. Well, a woman and an engineered man are sent in a gigantic sentient spe- starship to search space for a place to start a new life cycle. Raj decides to take a look around the ship. He comes across a gigantic robotic cleaner combine shoes. That's the summary on here. For yeah, it. So, so this part so of aliens, it's, it's fitted that into aliens, obviously, isn't it? Yeah, this weird, it's like the this woman and engineered man, which you, mm. I mean, that's 1978. I don't know, when mm. was Alien? Was that 79? Yeah, 79. Uh, but the, the idea of the engineered man, so the idea of, you know, it's taken Ripley and he's, but yeah, it's weird that it's called Bishop Z, and Zeno. It. Yeah, and then it, the, the clean, it comes across a giant cleaner, which is the mother, I guess. At least Weird. it's not a giant Kleenex. Weird. That'd be a, yeah. like a giant handkerchief. And actually, Raj was played by William Wisher, oh, who wrote yeah. who wrote Terminator 2, didn't he? Okay. ba bam bam ba dam Good we yeah, got go. to the bloody Terminators. And, oh, oh, God. Anyway, Aliens yeah. is a bony fide classic, isn't it? So It really is. And really you is should have gone seen that instead of uh, Hunter's Blood. Oh, God, well, yeah. so. Although I did actually watch Hunter's Blood because um, it's all on YouTube. The whole film is on YouTube. So I did sit and watch it. And there is one really gross moment when someone gets the head blown off by a shotgun, but the rest of it's pretty much as you'd imagine. As you'd imagine. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. and it actually, the two, two interesting things about it, just as an aside, it's got, obviously it's got Joey Travolta in it, but it's also got um, the guy that played... He's in the Untouchables. He plays. Um, oh, I can't remember his name, but the the guy who sets the bomb up at the beginning and the one who yeah. throws off the building. The one, yeah, the one who the one who kills um, Thingy's character. Yeah, he's in it. Plays a young version of him. I can't remember his name, but he's in it. Yeah, no, I know what you mean. And also, it's got. Um, it is a guy that always seems to hang around with. Um, he's the char- He's the kind of buddy character to Ham Tyler in V. He's also in. Um, he plays a lot with Michael Ironside so he's also he plays a guy on the train Total Recall he's like a sort of a Texas sounding accent kind of a chunky looking guy with a beard if you saw him in V or you saw him in Total Recall you know what I'm talking about he's in it anyway plays a kind that, of th- violent uh, rednecky type of guy that guy you're on about is Billy Drago Billy Drago that's it yeah so he's in it he's quite good in it uh-huh. as well so anyway that's Punter's Punter, Punter. he was also in Delta Force 2 it was a, there was a slew of films, wasn't there? Hunter's Blood, Deliverance, and then there was one called... Um, there was Southern Comfort. Southern Comfort, that's it. That's the one I was trying to think of, yeah. Yeah, quite a few. Yeah. All right, yeah. there we go. I think we end there, yeah? I think that's yeah, uh, yeah, loads, film, I think, loads there. Loads of stuff there. So that's your film and TV for September 1986. Stay with us, because we'll be back soon with a final load of games from this month, and there's still quite a few to go through. So, yeah, be back in a bit. great big massive shout out to our sponsor davidhernwriter.com where you'll find bargain books ebooks and audiobooks coming soon dave's next book escape from the commodore 64 will take you back to the 80s as sarah who gets sucked into her brother's computer just like bunty bailey got pulled into aha's take on me video there she must find a way to escape and it won't be easy i mean did you ever manage to escape from targ dave's podcast pick is nothing he thought they were all rubbish so instead he's picking shogun once again where he played as bandit blood and caused Chaos. Hello, Yoko. Okay, welcome back. 
so we've got our last load of games. I still do mean loads. This is like an entire episode worth sometimes. And our first one is, well, <laughs> this could have been a budget one. It's four ninety five. It's a 92% game. This is Hercules. So I'll, I'll talk about Hercules first. I think we might diverge a bit here on Hercules. <laughs> um, weirdly, but we'll see. Um, so Hercules is a rock hard, it's a rock hard platformer with crap graphics and sound. It's what it is. This punishing doesn't come close to this. You, so you play Hercules and in typical Hercules fashion, you've got to complete your 12 tasks. Now, unlike normal Hercules tasks where you are wrestling lions or punching bears or whatever, whatever Hercules would want to do, the tasks here consist of bounding around various screens and platforms at a very, very fast pace. Every screen is almost a, a puzzle because you're very little time to judge what to do as platforms will burst into flames quickly and you've almost got to make split second decisions which will usually result in your death you're gonna you want to get three of them and it's game over games last i don't know 10 15 seconds at push sometimes before you're back to the title screen if you manage to make a uh, 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 Every screen kind of has a target on it, which is the thing you're trying to chase. So, or it could be a door. So it could be the Hydra. It could be the lion. It could be something or other. If you manage to make it onto the target on the screen, then it usually turns into a door. You go through the door. It, you're onto the secondary screen and it continues. You're trying to work it out. This, so there are 50 of these screens to work your way through. And at first, when you first play this, this feels, this looks, it looks awful. And it, you think this is an unfair mess of a game. And then you play it a little bit more and you realize that this isn't a mess of a game this is a this is a memory test game essentially it's a memory test reaction game with those 50 trying to get through those 50 screens now if you are of a masochistic nature you could very well enjoy this because it's fast we've always you know one of the things we've spoken about with a lot of the games is treacle speed this is certainly not that this is fast it's responsive it moves at a pace it is quick. Like I said, games can last 15, 20 seconds. You're done. You're about the slowest thing about it is trying to get back into the game because it is a bit slow in when you when you die and go through the title screens again. It has no flourishes at all. These are the, the most rudimentary of graphics. The, the, the backgrounds are single colours. The platforms are the most basic of almost character graphics. The, the flames and everything, they're just characters. The sprites are simple and sunk single colour. You are almost a stick man, or, but not. So this... You know, it could be character graphics for all the difference it makes. This could be a square jumping around anything. And and this reminded me of things like um, N++, the ninja one. It reminded me of things like Super Meat Boy, V, 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 V. You know, later rock hard platformers that would come out and people would love. They would love because of that rock hard nature. This is platforming at speed. And I found myself becoming actually, as I played, kept coming back to it because your first couple of goes are so like, what the hell? What the hell is going on here? What is, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm dying quickly. Then you start to get into thinking, oh, this platform, because how do I get across this? There's not enough platforms, but platforms will appear as you jump Mario kind of style. They will just appear out of nowhere. You kind of have to work it out. That platform will turn into fire and kill you instantly. This platform, will... you work your way through screen after screen and you start to get used to it. And you start to get where to jump and you move around and you do it quickly. And then it, the challenge becomes, right, next screen, next screen. All right, where do I die there? All right. And the problem is, one of the things is, is that, it always starts you on a random screen. So you're kind of trying to figure out, you've got to remember, oh, right, I'm on this screen. Where do I go? When they, oh, damn, damn, damn it. I'm on this screen. Where do I go? Okay, yeah. And, and that's what it is. It's It makes, I put that this makes unfairness almost like a mechanic. It it, it plays upon that. And, and I actually quite like this. And I know this is not going to be for everyone. I'm not pretty sure this may not be for you. I don't know. But this, it's quickness, it's responsiveness, it's bare bones no nonsense speed platforming kind of appealed to me and, and i felt this was a lot better than a hell of a lot of other platformers were played i don't think it's worth 92 percent. i think that's crazy talk it's a high rated i think it'd be high rated i put it in the 70s somewhere but i think this is you know take take away the basicness if all you've got is a square and you're just jumping that around in basic nation this at speed and trying to figure out a way through the thing this is not a bad game but i don't know i don't think it's for everyone i'm not sure if it's for you what, what did you think I don't dig these kind of multi-death simulator, insta-death games. I don't. I don't like Super Meat Boy. I don't like Nin Plus Plus. I don't like any of them. So the logic of this game was completely wasted on me. I just don't, I don't dig it. I don't find any fun in it. I don't find any fun in trying to figure it out. I just find them repetitive and shit. And this was no exception. <laughs> um, I thought the graphics were inept. But there was no, they made no secret of that. So it's not like they were trying to be anything good. It was just badly done. And that was kind of the point. Keep it simple. Keep the graphics super simple. And it's all about the gameplay. And the gameplay is fun if you like that. 
I didn't. I uh, found it a very frustrating experience at best. And that might be for some people. And it, it doesn't keep me repeatedly wanting to go back for more. I just felt like it's... And I've seen... And, I'm, and yet, I know, I'll sit and watch my youngest lad sit and play Super Meat Boy for ages. And he'll, you know... But that does allow... I think you get a lot more death opportunity to repeat the same thing. This keeps... You know, you, you don't keep going back to the same level on it, which is a little bit annoying. So is there a good game in there somewhere? Maybe for those people that really like that kind of game. And it is early on, so it's kind of unique in that respect. I don't think that was by design. I think that was by pure bloody accident. Um, and, <laughs> I think, and I don't think this game was ever designed to be anything other than a serious Hercules type game. That it became a multiplayer deathathon is just simply a, a happy coincidence that, that they thought, well, okay, if people are playing that way, fine. Let's just keep it at that. I didn't dig it. I don't get how it got 92%. I wouldn't have given it over 50% for me. I thought it was awful. But that's me. I don't know. I don't know why they called it Hercules, really. It just seemed completely superfluous to anything that it was about. You may as well have called it, you know, anything. Blocky McBlobison. Yeah. But I just, you know, after the first few deaths, I was just like, you know what? I just, I just can't be asked. <laughs> can't be bothered with it <laughs> I, I completely get that I, I, and and these these games can be like that they they, they, they do punish they do you know I don't it's not entirely them. it's not entirely for me I'm not a massive hardcore platformer no, I just, fan I, don't, I just don't dig dying repeatedly in a game I don't I don't see the fun in it I like to progress it when I'm playing a game and I don't feel like I did and I just thought eh, nah not for me not for me at all. No, that's entirely 100% fair enough. I, I, I thought that, that, that this would not be up your alley, so we no, say. I'll give it a go. I just thought it was I just thought it was a bit of a joke, and I thought their review was a joke, quite honestly. Yeah, I, I mean, it's quite possible, but I think they actually genuinely did like it, and I can see why, because th- I think they're all in the same ballpark. Yeah, I, think I get this that is, they liked this... it. I just don't think that this game was worth 90%, in the, based on their reviewing criteria. That makes it better, but almost as good as, if not slightly better than Green Beret. No, I know, I know. I get all that. I do. Don't dig it, no. That's why I I wouldn't have rated it that high. No, nowhere near. But it's not full price. It's not, is it? Four ninety five though. Still one ninety nine, and this would have been a, you know, even at one ninety nine, I think just tiresome. I get tired of those kind of games very quickly, and then that's just, I think, I just, I can't be bothered. <laughs> Can't be to die fair enough. And, uh, that's fair enough. That's Hercules. It's a. I think if you like rock hard platformers, you might get something from it. If, yeah, but if, if you, you don't, don't even stuff. look at it. No, if you like yeah. insta, insta death games and the Super Meat Boy type idea without the gore and the effects and then the graphics and all the fun, play it. <laughs> yeah, what he said. <laughs> still. Oh, there we go. Still rate that better than the next one. Yeah. Yeah, Graham. Okay. Tell us about... We've already met, re- referenced these earlier on sort of thing, but now tell us about Way of the Tiger. More ninja rubbish. <laughs> well, the Way of the Tiger books, game books, they are a choose-your-own-adventure series of books by Mark Smith and Jamie Thompson, set on the mm-hmm. world of Orb. And you, in the books, take part of a young ninja, Avenger, who originally, I think, is on a quest to avenge his father and then recover some scrolls and later the books present you with other interesting things to do and take over a kingdom and do all sorts of other stuff. So there's a series of books and they're based around this one character that you obviously create your character sheet. You then choose the various paths and some of those paths lead to variously described deaths. Others lead to <laughs> conflict and you have to, cho- you have to choose your own adventure. So you choose to do a particular thing and it says go to page six and you go to page six and then so on and so forth. You lose six health points or, you know, that you get the idea. So this is a classic, another classic case of a everything that you need is there for you. Yep. So yep. you've got ninjas, combat moves described, an entire world of enemies and monsters and creatures and, and, pl- and plot. plot and story. Everything you need is there as a game. What you end up with, with Way of the Tiger on the C64, is essentially a... a a fighting warrior type game, for one of, but at least you go left or right. But a game where, because you can play and you can practice either the unarmed combat, which and the, and the, so what it's done is taken elements of the book because in the book you can become a master at different techniques and you can choose some of the techniques when you start and you develop them as you go through the book. And there are unarmed combat techniques and then you have weapons and then you have so you have sword and a pole. And in this game, when it starts. And it took ages to start. Um, mm-hmm. You can choose to either practice the unarmed combat, the pole and the sword fighting, or you can play a game, which is essentially the exact same thing, only you're not practicing and you're just kind of wandering left and right, fighting and stuff. Now, 
you come across different enemy types, of which I only encountered three. A ninja that looked exactly like you, a midget with a dagger, um, a, <laughs> kind of a goblin, and a, a, a ghost, I want to say, cloud ghost thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and you fight them with the various fighting moves, of which are really limited. Now, I didn't realise until much later that there's, you can actually press the space bar in this to unleash a whole other series of moves that you have on the joystick. But either way, even with that in mind... So you've got 16 fight moves in this game, of which they're really badly animated. There's no payoff and connection with the ninjas and things that you're fighting. And it, and and also, doesn't really appear to have a purpose. You just appear on this level and just walk and fight. And I wasn't sure really, um, was I meant to be collecting the scrolls from something? Was there any of the way of the tiger world in this game? And I came to the conclusion that it isn't. It's just they've just taken the first six pages of fighting description, which is the, about the first six to ten pages of all of the uh, all of the way of the tiger books as the description of the moves and the weaponry and stuff. And they just mm-hmm. made that into a kind of a fighting warrior-esque Amazon women game, similar, Legend of the Amazon Woman type bashathon, with no real fighting that makes any kind of impact or sense and just it's just diarrhea terrible terrible game the music on it is god awful i don't get how you make this wrong even if you took it at its most basic and made it like yusagi yajimbo it would have been better than this i don't get it I don't get who were you who did gremlin hand this to that could mess it up so royally and then they think okay we'll put it out and later down the line they actually release a second way of the tiger game called avenger which is actually a lot better than this why miles better but a very different kind of game so i think this one they got stuck on the idea of having a combat game around ninjas and couldn't think about anything else and just lost there's some nice graphic touches in terms of the parallax scrolling that's about the only good thing on it the rest of it's completely forgettable very boring and Mm -hmm. considering the premise and the material they had to make a game tragedy so i i really hate this game i don't like it at all it's such a travesty compared to the books which are actually way better than playing this game and probably about the same price so i'd go and buy one of those but you yeah i'm pretty much exactly in agreement with you this seems to have been given to in-house gremlin coders because the people who Mm. two people who did it did things like well, one of them worked on Monty on the Run, Jack the Nipper, loads of stuff. Loads of stuff. Uh, worked on Avenger, and the other guy did lots of other bits. Um, Chris Kerry and Jason Perkins, mm. Mask to uh, RoboCop to to some stuff for Ocean, Super Sports, Gremlin Graphics, thing about his back. Yeah, um, Way of the Tiger, a dull fighting game that misses the point of the books entirely. Is my first sentence. Yep. I've played through all the books um, in my time. I was a you know huge fighting fan. I still am a huge fighting mm. fantasy uh, game book fan. Um, I've played through all of them and to see it reduced to crap fighting is kind of a bit of it's almost a slap in the face you know because i invested a lot of time in playing these playing these books and i was thinking oh it's gonna be away the tiger game it's gonna be great you know it's gonna be cool moving around orb and adventures and stuff and avoiding you know mandrake's attention and all that kind of nonsense mm. no just three crap fighting games the you know the combat because the combat in the get in the books is it's necessary, like the combat in any of those books is, but it's it's kind of it's secondary to the story and the plot and what's going on and uncovering stuff and finding stuff out. But making it all about the combat is just a huge misstep. And the problem is as well is that wouldn't be so bad if the combat was actually any good, but it's not. No, nope. it's you know the three fight. You know, it's not even like three fighting games on offer. The unarmed poles and swords are any good they've all got re- unresponsive controls and really yep. woolly collision detection there's no sense of connection or b- hitting anything nope and this is in the same issue as night games if you want a multi-event bashathon do you go get night games it's the same mm. price and it's way way better you know you've got the added bonus of the archery and the crossbow in there as well and there's six events and it's two player. This was just rubbish. Um, mm. a, a real, you know, a real like disappointment for a fa- someone who's a fan of the books themselves, and just felt I don't know. And the sprites were rubbish. It's terrible. They're like graphics. single color see through, and 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 the the background there was all this parallax scrolling going on all over the place, which seemed to not. I mean, Zap actually made a point of sort of reviewing the parallax scrolling in the last paragraph of the review, which was kind of weird. But it's the only like, good thing in it. It is, but the parallax doesn't seem to work when you're walking along and the clouds nope. all get jittery and buggery nope. and, oh, no, I get what they're trying to do. And, you know, so they just kept it for the foreground stuff and the background stuff. All right, fair enough. But this is a bad game. 
a bad game that could have been like you were saying you've you've been handed everything you want on a plate yep. for a world and an idea and stuff you can do with it and you boil it down to three crap fighting mm. modes no bit like no, this at all i mean it's only we're, we're talking what a few months away now really from stuff like last ninja and stuff like that where somebody did take it a bit more seriously and make a a, a better and not perfect but a better game but yep. goodness me i mean and avenger does come out and avenger is very different it's more like a bit more like druid isn't it but more top down yeah it's but it's yeah. still better than this at least it's it's, it's got a more of a purpose and more of a it's more about ninjas and stuff than this one is i just don't get it i don't get this i don't get why they would do it like that but no no i don't understand it i thought this was terrible no, no, so. what a waste yeah yeah it's not the way of the tiger not as i understand it nope it got 64 uh, percent as well which baffled me because i'd have given it less way less maybe in the 40s I would, it, uh, this, uh, this would have been this would have been in the 30s for me mm, i think yep. this is a, an, utter, an utter mess of a game yep, i agree yeah uh, there we go. Quans flail on them, and then after that, <laughs> um, Mandrake's attention. Mandrake's full bore attention, which nobody survives. And nobody. Then, and then uh, what I'm going to try and find is a. Uh, I'll read out at this point. I'll find it in my Avenger book. I'll read out an Avenger death, and that's what I All think right. of that game. So I'll I'll put that in. Just as long as it's someone from far far off Wargrave Abbas. Well, I've got. If actually I've got it here. That's... <laughs> oh no. Yeah, very good. Is that is that book two? Um, I'm not sure. I think it's book two, yeah, because the first one is Way of the Tiger, isn't it? Well, no, the first one's Avenger. Avenger, yeah. And that's, this I'm, is Avenger, I'm not, I'm not Assassin. Sure. You need to look it what up is on, the... on YouTube or uh, something. Yeah, yeah, bad, bad game. Yes, I don't oh. think this one's as death-laden. Just saw a picture of a rat th- man. I thought the second one was... Um, I thought that go. was Mandrake, wasn't it? Suddenly you rip the canvas open and jump into the tent to be greeted by gasps of astonishment. With blurring speed, you hurl a shuriken at Jiyuku's throat. Your throw is accurate, but somehow, incredibly, it has little effect, leaving only a slight gash to mark its passage, damn it. In a moment, Akira has an arrow ready in his bow, and Jakiru has shouted for the guards. You manage to avoid Akira's first arrow, but soon the guards are upon you. And, whilst you dispatch them with a series of kicks and punches, Akira has sent another arrow straight through your neck and out the other side. It is all over, and you die in a pool of blood. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) And that's what I think of you, Harvey. <laughs> you didn't follow the ninja way by flighting in no. our bed. And what I just read is way more interesting than anything to do with the way the tiger game. <laughs> Let me tell you. Yeah. Go and play the books. Is. The Choose Your Adventure books are genuinely good. Yeah, they are very good. Right, that's that. Up next we have another we have another droid game. So we had Floyd the Droid last week. This week we have droids. Mm. Although they're not very similar. Because this is another one. So we've got another episode and another spaceship has gone off the rails and heading somewhere to blow it up. Uh, we see yeah. a lot of that. Yes, whether amazing. It's, whether it's Paradroid, Iridium, <laughs> Chi- was it Chimera? Chimera. Chimera. Yep. There's another one. There's Chimera. Always so many. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the one. But in this case, we have Edward, the battleship, who's off to blow up Venus for, yes. reason, for reasons. You mean the <laughs> Environmental Defence Warden, or Edward, as he's known? No, I just mean Edward. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Edward. Uh, it's something to do, uh, it's, yeah, something to do with the solar flare. Anyway, you beam on board, and it's some kind of cross between this Paradroid and V. You make your way through the ship to try and take it down. Varanoid. Why are so many games riff? <laughs> Varan. <laughs> yeah. Paravroid. Paravroid. Uh, you try to take so the game is a 2D side on so it looks like it looks like V in a sense and, and your droid looks very loosely animated it doesn't look like a droid at all he's way too bendy he's got bendy arms that's Metal Mickey the background use every shade of grey at the C64's disposal which is a lot <laughs> um, uh, and the other robots look like floaty nonsense or angry slices of cheese they do um, which is what I thought um, very angry I thought this was so there are terminals there are lifts there are doors. You get where well, I'm going with this. Use a map. You can go and stuff. You've got to, to get your health back. You have to do some weird kind of Frogger mini game in the terminals. I, I could not get that to. Oh, I did it once. I did it once. Drag me up. You get your energy. You get your energy fully back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, nice so plan. you run along. You can shoot. You know, other droids take a few shots to shoot. You shoot them, but they're shooting you. It's. I don't know what this was about. You've got to get from one side of this nonsense <laughs> to another. It all looks very grey and very boring. It's. <sighs> If you're going to mix up two games, Paradroid and V could be okay, but not like this, in the words of The Matrix, which I watched again last night. <laughs> not like this. Not like this. <laughs> not like this. It's just it's just really dull, and and there are other colours to use. You know, spaceships are not 
don't have to be grey. Mm. Uh, there can be, you know, brown. other colours. <laughs> brown. CC Tour's got loads of browns. Brown. Uh, I found this really dull and, and just un- unpleasant to play and boring and, uh, you know, just, I don't know. Did you like it? No, no. My take on this was, so what you're asking me to do after all of your environmental defense warden, codename Arachnid, prototype warship, blah, 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 is wander around, going up and down some stairs and through some doors and search computers and stuff. And, well, I play. I said I said to you, I said when, I, when we were looking at other games earlier on, this just seems to be a lot of this wandering multi-level search stuff games at the moment. Yeah, yeah, there is, yeah. Now, when we're going even as back as in the previous episodes, previous differences, where there was some in there as well. So no, it had no more attraction to me than any of those. This was just a poor, poorer version of other better games. I mean, in this episode alone, the better version of this kind of wandering around, this mission, impossible mission simulator, for want of a better description, even if they're you know, it's wearing different, slightly different trousers, there's better games in this episode that we've played. So just... Yeah. just don't bother with it. Go, go play. Go play Mission AD. Yeah, yeah. If you want to, just, and, and you have to search for a lot of stuff in that. You know, just looking for people in that and shooting them. Um, yeah. But just don't get involved or play the uh, the Mission Elevator. If you want to play a game that's a bit more playable and a bit less unrewarding, because yeah. this isn't very rewarding, is it? And again, it's just no. They've seen everyone else making these games and they've just decided to make one of their own. There's nothing original or new or interesting about this premise, this idea, and the graphics are borderline inept and very grey and boring. So sod off droids. <laughs> and that's my take. It was it got the right score, forty six percent at seven ninety five is about right. So I agree with that one. Well done Zap. Yeah, well done Zap. That's enough on droids. I don't want to talk about robots anymore. I want to talk about other things. I want to talk about our next game. Graham, tell us about Trap the Demo. <laughs> All right. And let's just forget about the game. Well, the thing is, right. No, tell us about Trap. Tra- there's not a lot to it. It's a shoot em up, uh, not a very good one as well. So it's got really, it's a shoot em up. So top down, bottom up. I don't know how do you describe that. Bottom up, I guess. Ver- vertical scrolling. Vertical scrolling, shoot em up. Yes. Like Warhawk. Yeah, similar to Warhawk. Really weirdly fat, chunky graphics. So um, fat, sort of so blodgy, chunky, so horrible. Blodgy graphics that are really ugly. And I think it's it's almost like it's over base relief. It's like someone's got the stroke tool and then had a stroke when they were using it. <laughs> Um, so big blodgy you can multi-spaceship things ish but they're not really very well designed you end up being pummeled repeatedly by things flying at you enemies all over the place and you shoot at them to do stuff so your chance of survival uh, on this game is just a matter of time before you're dead really there's no way around that because it just piles enemies until you die and it contains a demo and so the music in this game does not suit the game at all in any way shape or form so the music is really amazing, okay? But I'm, yeah. not, I'm, and I'm actually going to take the music out of this game and look at it separately. I have a very, very strong affinity for the trap music. It's the best thing that we Music ever did, and it's Ben, Douglas, ben Douglas's masterpiece. It is beautiful. It's an amazing piece of music in every capacity that it could be. And the great tragedy of, of all of this is that, I mean, I, I was a friend of Ben's, and all Ben wanted to be was the conductor of an orchestra playing his orchestral version of trap. That's that was one of his big asks. Sadly, he died before that ever came to be a reality. But mercifully, thanks to Chris Abbott and a number of other amazing people, that music became a reality and was performed by an orchestra at, at the 8-Bit Symphony. Amazing time. So I have a very strong affinity for that piece of music and it's beautiful. It's just completely irrelevant to this game. This game may as well not exist. In this game, it's a, it's a crappy shooter and not a very good one at that. Loads of brown graphics that aren't very nice and kind of bass relief nonsense like we've already said. The music does not sit well with that. It's this kind of a weird demo-y vibe to the whole game, really. It almost feels like, like you say, a, a demo with a game strapped on. Now, the demo is, I think you, to get the demo, you have to achieve a certain score. You type in a certain name in the scoreboard and then the demo appears. And it's basically a series of uh, events in terms of visuals happening to the music. So there's like a drummer there and the music's kind of a slow-paced drumming and there's that. Now, it's demo is okay for its time and demos on the C64 become genuinely astonishing over time so this is very early on so this is the time when graphics and music were kind of just becoming something that you could do something with outside of that so because there was a lot of demos at this point on CompuNet which were really nicely drawn images and maybe a scroll text and scroll pop this was the first one that actually had kind of an animated theme and a character and then kind of went with the music maybe not the first but one of the first so trap demo is amazing i don't believe that 
that demo and the music justify a £7.95 price tag for a game that is really kind of an afterthought. I don't think much thought even went into that game at all, if it's even finished, really. So Trap isn't a great game, but it is an amazing demo. I wouldn't want to pay seven ninety five for it though. I wouldn't have. I'd have been quite miffed about that. And it's a classic game of it's a Tony Crowther game, isn't it? So you know that it's going to be stupidly, insanely difficult, if not impossible, which it is. And it's got great music in it. What can you say? I, I don't like the game. I do like the music and the demo in there is okay for its time, but the music is the thing. But it's a lot of money for a bit of music, isn't it? In, the, yeah. in its time and I think the magazine reviews being very kind I think they're being very kind to everything because it got 82% I don't really believe if I was hand on heart you know 82% for what what's it based on you know, it's a, it's not a great game at all if we've played games that are more finished than this that got a lower score this feels you know it's nowhere near that but you know the music is uh, easy in the 99% it's just it's just an amazing piece of music so what do you think it's a mess of a shoot 'em up um, it is it's horrible from, so as a shoot 'em up the, this this the shtick of this is that you control the vertical scrolling speed you can stop and speed up and slow down and what have you mm. um, and that's fair enough that's that's actually quite a nice idea you've been able to sort of control that sort of that's thing. right because you can push up and down the, can't you and up speeds yeah and, and you yeah. speed up and slow down but the, the problem is is that it's that's no good when the whole game is too is ra- completely random so and 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 it's too punitive and your craft is far too big big mm. um it's it's massive yeah you know it's like star it's like it's like playing a shoot 'em up with a, a star destroyer yeah uh, and it's shaped like a star destroyer as well but it's got the speed of that and but everything's coming at you and you can't actually plan for anything because at any point anything could be coming down the screen and this this reaction is just because you've got to fit through holes in walls and stuff so it's not like you've got an entire level to sort of move around in there's just no fun here i remember not liking this back then and i didn't no, like it now when no, i played I it again no. Um, I don't like being put back at the beginning of the level every time I die, which no. takes ages because you have to fly out again. I don't like similar. I didn't like um, in uh, One Man and His Droid having to do that stupid opening section where you have to mm. get up the thing, and in this you have to get past those stupid shiny coin grey nonsense things. Yeah, it's what? Why? It's just pointless. Who, who thought this was a good idea? Obviously, you know, Rat did. I don't think Tony Crowther did, but this this feels again like. There's no thought to the game design here. No. There's no, you know, it's just it's just a mess of random stuff that keeps happening. And mm. I'm sorry, but whoever thought that those those left to right electric beam fast things were a good idea is just it's just nonsense because you can't move fast enough through them to get past them, and it's just stupid. And it, everything around the game, though. If you take the game out of the equation. <laughs> the presentation is really nice. I like the book part at the beginning where it sort of goes from page to page showing you the points offered for each enemy. Although there all seem to be 100, so it seems a bit pointless. That's quite nice. Yeah, you get a score. You type in the word demo. If anyone's looking for that, you type in demo or, you, you know, demo on the high score thing. And then it kicks off the demo. The demo is lovely. It's nice to watch. It is a great piece of Ben uh, Ben Dagley's music. Mm. I'm not going to think... I'm not... I prefer the first sort of three or four minutes to the rest. Yeah. The first, yes, you know, the really atmospheric piece at the beginning sort of thing it goes a bit twiddly towards the end and, and well it has, yeah, a, has okay. a little moment of War of the Worlds War of the it, Worlds it? Yeah, like yeah it does yeah and it's, it's okay I just like that sort of slow, slow beginning build it reminded me of uh, Driller yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, which comes down later but as a game this is it's not very good it's a, it's, a, it's just a mess of a shoot 'em up which seems you know I don't like and again we talk about students making games we talk about people making games where they there's no thought to the waves and how they sort of approach the player and in a shoot 'em up if you play like like the classics like Radiant Silvergun like Ikaruga you you learn the patterns you progress you get better at it randomly throwing stuff at you because you've just done, you know done stuff is not how you make a game it's just random and it's not fun because you can't learn it and you can't get better at it you want to feel like you're progressing and getting better and this does none of that so trap for me is a i'd, I'd change one letter in that name if i was uh gonna name it but no, there you go. i i i, um, I love so the be, music but i agree i think it is it's, it is not a great game at all it's not so it's a bit of a shame there you go that's that's uh that's tran is what i was trying to say i changed the p to an n <laughs> if, if you if you were wondering tran or traff trap trip tri- trip <laughs> Yeah, it's not a trip. It's a bad trip. Jeepers Creepers, where'd you get those peepers? Jeepers Creepers, where'd you get those eyes? So that's that. Let's move on. We've got two more Cheapers Creepers left. 
before we actually do have a couple of crap verts to look at. They're back. They won't go away. They won't stop printing bad pictures. But anyway, what's our first cheapest creepers? Formula One Simulator. So when this boots up, that tune is very familiar. Mm. I've heard that tune a lot in a lot of demos and a lot of oh, things. God, did, you, did you use it? I've, u- I've used anything? it loads. Yeah, it's, I used it in... Um, yeah. It's it's in the background of Real Writer. One yeah. Of the, one of the main background songs in that. Yeah, so, yeah I've heard I, that I, lo- I've used it loads. Yeah, I've heard that loads. When I kicked out, I was like, oh, I remember this. In fact, I've used it in the background on this very podcast many times. Probably where I've heard it then. That's probably where I recognise it. But I really recognise it. It is a good tune. I do like that tune. Same can't be said for the game, because this is a, a really bad pole position knockoff. Really bad. Really bad. So it's one ninety nine. It's from, I think it's a Mastertronic game, isn't it? It is. Uh, you pick from eight different real world tracks and play a very bad approximation of pole position. You accelerate by pushing up and change gear with the fire button, steer left and right around a vaguely arcade track. It looks like pole position. <laughs> if you squint, the cars are made of dynamite as they explode with the slightest of touches from each other. I'm not going to say much more on this. It is what it is. You can play one track at a time or do the entire Grand Slam. Why you would decide to put yourself through that is anybody's guess, and I could never recommend that, even no. on my worst enemy. When Pit Stop 2 exists, there's no need for this. We keep saying it, you know, Pit Stop 2 is old now. It's two years old, yep. but it's still not been bedded, really. So when there is nothing, you know, when that when that's still there, and even in single player, it's way better than this. D- don't play this, even for two quid. It's a bad two quid, even to listen to some nice music. Go play Real Writer instead, um, which, is which is probably a better game. <laughs> but, um, more fun. Yeah, this is, this is a bad, bad game. Did you get anything from it? Did you enjoy your pole p- pole position knockoff? No, I did not. I just I think on what planet does anyone... Well, I, I tried to think to myself, on what planet does this game exist in a world when P- P- Stop 2 is out? And I thought, okay, so it's it's one ninety nine, and that's that. Well, that's the push. That's the thing. That's the shtick. It's one ninety nine. So it's a it's a cheap in to a racing game that's like pole position ish, but you know, but not very good because pole position and and all the other games are more exp- way more expensive, so it's a cheap, cheap knockoff, really. There's literally no car logic in this game. They just float nope. around and hit you, because there's no logic in it. It's not a race. And I thought that was a big problem. I, I put it doesn't feel like a race, which in a Formula One simulator is a real problem. <laughs> yeah. So I thought the only good thing is the music in it. The rest of it's absolutely, utterly awful. Graphics are badly drawn. It's got that horrible bendy track thing that we saw in, you know, in very early other versions like Pole Position and uh-huh. a couple of other games of this type that have been just Tal- as equally... Talladega. Talladega and... Even the original Pit Stop was, you know, it's actually better than this, but it's not, even that's not saying a lot because the original Pit Stop was not great. Pit Stop 2 is out there. It's even at two years old, it's way better in every department than this game. Just save your money. It's probably on a budget label at this point, wasn't it? Yeah, it might easier have been. So I would I just say, why, why bother? Why bother with Formula One Simulator? Unless you really like Rob Hubbard, which in that, if that's the case and you're a, you know, a completist, then you might want it for your Rob Hubbard game collection. But I can't imagine any other worse reason why you'd buy it and play it because it's awful. If you had like a, a collection of Rob Hubbard games, would you would you have would you put them in a in a sort of secure place and call it your Hubbard cupboard? Cupboard, cupboard of Hubbard. The cupboard of Hubbard. The cup, the cupboardy Hubbardy. Cupboard of Hubbard. Cupboardy Hubbardy. Cupboard of Hubbard. Cupboard of Hubbard. Yes, in answer to your question, yes, I would. Yeah, you would. Jeepers creepers, where'd you get those eyes? All right, there we go. That's Formula One Simulator. That's our first, our last game of this mammoth couple of episodes coming up. And it's we saved the best to last. No, we didn't. No, we didn't. <laughs> Graham, video poker, fancy a game? No. It's still going to be the shortest living review, I think, this. <laughs> I think so, so. Video Poker is a poker game, but it's not really a poker game, is it? So it's really, it's just odd poker logic thrown into something that isn't really poker. So it's meant to be like poker as in a, a variant of Texas Hold'em. However, you pump fake coins into the machine. So it's basically trying to emulate a video arcade version of poker. Uh-huh. So you pump fake coins into the machine and then it presents you with your hand and you can choose to hold or not certain cards. And then there's the flop and then it's either your hand is a winner or it's not. And that's it. That's the game yep. logic. There's no, there's no more to it than that. There's no poker to it. There's no betting and hands and it's just coins in a slot. Do you get a, a decent hand on the flop? If you don't, you lose. End of game. That's it. Well, not end of game, just end of turn. It's just rubbish. Yep. <laughs> and, I, and, and I don't, 
ever say this, and I will never say this again, but if you're going to play a poker game compared to this one, I'd go and play Sam Fox over that. At least you're actually playing a variant of poker, albeit that, that that's equally crap. This is just the the worst of the crap. It got 13%. The graphics are bloody awful. The sounds are dead annoying in this game because it's, like- be, it's like, <laughs> trying to be really arcadey, so you get a kind of a joyful, jingly-jangly sound effect for literally everything. So you press the hold and blah, 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 and you press the other button, blah, 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 and then it's, blah, 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 blah. it's like, you're just bloody hell. It was like a cacophony of bloody arpeggios <laughs> going mad. <laughs> It made me laugh how the uh, each card because when you first drop it, when you first cards come down, it goes boop boop boop. Yeah, boop, yeah, height sort of boop. raises it pitched on it. But each tone is actually just not tied to the number of the card coming down. It's tied to whether it's one, two, three, four, or five. So if you hold one, two, and four, then three goes boop boop when five comes down. So there's no. It's not like one, two. It's three, no. five <laughs> on no. the on the notes. It's so stupid. This is utterly pointless. It's, just, it is a pointless, pointless game. At one ninety nine, it's still pointless. It's a fruit machine simulator, really, than a yeah, poker well, simulator. It, it, it is. And yeah, it is actually. Yeah, it's a fruit machine with cards. Yeah. graphics it is actually yeah exactly right it's a five it's a five slot one arm bandit essentially yeah and, and at the beginning it says oh what do you want to play and is it nickel dime quarters or dollars and it don't matter who cares you only get 20 of them <laughs> what difference does and, it, make? it makes no offerings because it just says oh you've won five or well, yeah, five what five one Ten. and i won a lot of the time based <laughs> on literally nothing so I, it came up i had a hand that I, in fact i played the game a few times just went through like pick the cards chose a couple of because there's no skill to what you could just pick you know you no. can i held a pair and and still lost. I'm like, how? And why and did I lose? High. Well, I, it's, it just makes no difference. And then in the end, I won by, and then suddenly I got like a royal flush or something. Like, what? What? The chances of that happening like a billion to one. I'm like, I'll just sod yeah. off with the crappy logic. I just, I clearly hadn't won in three games, so it decided to throw. And then I only won five. I'm like, you have won five. I'm like, oh right, okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> just, 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 just no thought into that game. Just get no. lost. Get lost. You yeah. Crappy video poker game. Die. <laughs> so that was yeah, my just, uh, take on that. Yeah, it was utterly rubbish. It was just uh, crap. Utterly it was terrible. Crap. Let's not talk about it anymore. No. Nope. That was video poker. That's the the last game. We didn't cover one game, which was Mercenary Second City. It's just more mercenary, isn't it? But as the uh, designated mayor of Targ, I feel that you might want to see how... Uh, have you been... Have you, you know, have you visited the second city? Spoke um. to your counterpart, mayor? <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't. We're not friends, me and the mayor of the second <laughs> city. I, I've been too busy in the land of my own <laughs> world of mercenary and Targ to even bother with what's going on in that crazy second city. They're arguing that they've got more hotels than we have. They don't. They're saying that they don't have sharks on their beach cause, just because we named our, our... We've got an Amity Island, which is completely <laughs> coincidental. <laughs> And I'm the, also the mayor of that town, and they tried to close the beach. Completely coincidental that we had a shark attack, although we don't call them sharks on Targ. We call them quangos, but that's just, you know, a quirk of being on Targ. So we had a quango attack. Um, nobody... <laughs> it, anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, the long and the short of it all is... Uh, no, I did briefly look at it, and it looked to me, going back just on the game for a second, it looked more, more of the same to me. I, I, I get it. I get... I mean, you know, I... I get the idea that, Mer- that Mercenary is this big game and the second city is another big adventure and, you know, and there's loads of... There's an entire world in there and I, and I understand all of that. I just don't dig lots of vector games like this. I don't dig them. Um, no. I'm happy in Targ as the mayor. I'm producing some postcards. You'll all be pleased to know. They'll soon be out. You can download them for free from the website. Send them to your friends. Do what you like with them so you'll be able to do that. But I'm sticking to Targ. I'm not venturing out. Did you Did you play it or look at it or anything, by the way? Because I, I, no, I only looked at I, YouTube. I look- I looked at it years and years ago. It's just more mercenary, and I'm not a mercenary fan, so why would I put myself no. through it? I put it in the games not covered section. Yeah, I, 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 you know, someone I don't said to me, "Justify you know, myself." If you played the you know elite Second City, I'd be like, "No, I haven't," because I have no desire to trade from Dizzo to Lave and, <laughs> and more of that. Which you know, oh, but it's not Dizzo and Lave; it's Pizzo and Pave. Well, okay, maybe it is, but it's still trading between Pizzo and Pave. No thanks. No, I get that there's an, an entire adventure on the Second City. Good luck, go and enjoy it. And when you finish that, come and stay in one of our hotels got a discount on at the moment all you can eat buffets every night beautiful it is the chef's from not from targ he's from quacker which is a very similar place about three three <laughs> three planets away um so he's the quacker chef he is a genuine gifted guy with it with a, a meat so, horse so <laughs> <laughs> that's not to talking about cooking. <laughs> Did I say he was things a chef? He, things he could do with a meat horse. 
You don't want <laughs> to know. Go- <laughs> make a billy goat puke. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we didn't cover that. No. <laughs> much to... Uh, much to uh, no. The, the uh, mirror attack anyway. has spoken. Go and visit the second city, but, you know... Yeah, we're not, we're not paying for it. <laughs> Don't, you're not doing it on our dollar. No. No, we're not. <laughs> Do it on your own. Um... <laughs> Right, we've got crap verts. We've got two crap verts. Uh, it may look like three, but it's actually two. So uh, the first one is Thai boxing. Now, you may be looking at that going, that's the romp. That's how that's in the mag. <laughs> what, sideways? Yeah. <laughs> I turned it on its right way down below, but oh, that's yeah, yeah. how it appears in the magazine. Now, there's lots of things wrong with this advert. Not, be, not so first many. of all. So, so, so the magazine is, you know, as you, a normal magazine, this has been printed. If you remember the, the old Airwolf one, we talked about way, way, way back. Uh, it's the same one. So it's... it's been printed what landscape portrait landscape whatever it's, it's, it's landscape so it's, it's, weird it's wrong <laughs> it's also if you zoom in that the the kicking on the faces is really bizarre but i don't understand why they've included a uh, an extended picture a smaller picture of it within the advert <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking about that isn't that weird and it's like it's like it's caught a, a sneaky picture of someone getting out of bed so it's yeah. like a, it's, <laughs> What's going on? Why? Why is that happening? Why is that someone just getting out of bed and then two people just one guy's being kicked in his chin? About <laughs> I don't just, know. what's going on? It's really weird, isn't it? Yeah, it's very strange. It's got three D action though. This tie boxing. What do you think? If you try right? and read it, it's from Anko, isn't it? I, Oof, I knew as soon as I saw the word Anko, I was like, oh, here we go. Do you know? Look at those faces. Look well, at the face on the guy kicking. <laughs> everything about the anatomy is wrong his arm's really thin he's got a really big shoulder and a really thin arm the guy in yellow he's like he's got he's, he's very thin yeah. of arm and then the mountains in the background why anyway just it's just everything about it is bad and you'd think right on a they've obviously taken over that entire landscape page for a reason the one reason you would th- expect to do that might be to you want to put bigger screen grabs of your game <laughs> <laughs> not, not the case here. They're just going to make them just as small. There's a speech bubble coming from the, an N, which is shouting the prices of the games. Just, just an N, a talking N, um, come, and that's coming from the mini version of the picture with the extended bed scene. And, and I'm trying to figure out what that is just behind the people on the bed. And it looks know. is that a, is that a, a cat from behind or a lion's ass? I don't. I don't, I don't know. I, I don't even know why that's there. And what's really weird is it says at the bottom corner of that it says CBM sixty four one to eight at the bottom of that. Then if you go to the speech will come from the N, it says CBM one two eight disc only. I don't understand this advert, and then I don't get it. Nope. And they're nobody not, does. They're, they're not Thai boxing either, because Thai boxing's done in a ring. <laughs> yep. <laughs> with, I don't. Uh, it's the smaller. It's the smaller postcard version within the bigger picture that <laughs> freaked me out. It's somebody that's described Thai boxing to somebody, and they've gone right. I'm, I can draw that, and this is the net result. So um, his. <laughs> Leg position is badly unbalanced. If you look at the guy who's having his chin kicked, his left leg is actually back and to the and over his yep. right leg, but also, but his foot is actually behind his right foot. So it's just it's just you know he's going down. He's also kicked him kicked him so hard that he's made the skin on his back run like wax on a candle. <laughs> has, yeah, and they've used that they've used the mini image of the the extended edition of the Thai boxing advert with the people on the bed to cover the guy in yellow's crotch, but they haven't covered it up in the uncut version, which is underneath. So you can just see his full <laughs> full you know full bore, <laughs> full um, Thai bulge. It's like it's like some crap version of Spot the Difference when there's loads of blatant differences. I don't get it. I don't get no. why the three D with three D action is over to the left on the bottom image, but underneath. Neath Thai boxing on the big image. Why have they got that image there? It's why is it there? Why has it got? To, why has it got talking N? <laughs> it is the very definition of a crap bird. I mean, they've got the Thai boxing typeface right, but the colours are all wrong. So it's got kind of a horrible orangey brownish colour yeah. on a sky of I don't know what planet they're on, but it ain't Earth with a sky like that. <laughs> it's just it's all kinds of wrong. So and the game images, if they're anything to go by, it looks like an isometric Thai boxing. Simulator. It is. I seem to actually remember this being all right because it's you, you, when you kick them and smack them, the the faces in the corner get all beaten up and bruised and bleeding and everything. Uh, I seem to remember playing this quite a bit. Yeah, um, it says see the cuts and bruises on the faces, and yeah, it says lightning moves, six spectacular backdrops. I am not holding my breath with that little game. Well, I I think I remember playing this a fair chunk just because I like the. Or I might be getting this confused with uh, Bangkok, Bangkok, Bangkok Nights. Nights, yeah. 
That was another one that was similar. That yeah. was like a symmetric type film, wasn't it? But I think yeah. I did play big, this big a bit. in that. Yeah, yeah. It yeah. Just rings a bell. I hope it's a good bell, but looking at that fight there, it's not going to be. And, that's, and I'm still <laughs> but, mystified but, as to why there's just two people sat on a bed on a big mattress. No, well, <laughs> what would be good is if there was a smaller version of the fight, same fight going on in the main game. <laughs> to, to, that would be good. What they should have done is just carried on that theme. So in that mini Thai boxing advert in the <laughs> there's corner, another... there's another mini Thai boxing advert and it just goes for infinite, <laughs> infinite for some reason. And in each one, there's slightly different. So there's the two people on the bed in the mini, mini version are like you know doing something else. And then in the mini, mini, mini version, they're like, there's only one of them and he's, he's murdered the other one with a spoon or something. And then in the mini, 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 mini version, later down the line, there's like one guy and he's just like crying himself to sleep. And I don't know. <laughs> You, you could, you know, it's, it, you could extend the logic of that crazily way more than you'd want to. <laughs> yeah, good advert. It's because it's a uh, next one. <laughs> God, what? So this is from the same people that bought brought us. Who was it? It was uh, Richard Branson's. Oh God, the Branson Simulator. Yeah. So his, his speedboat challenge. And now we've got Arcana. And oh, I, and I have to say, this is perhaps the most boring advert. <laughs> <laughs> is it it looks like a an, an advert for a castle yeah come to our chateau yeah <laughs> come to our yeah. chateau uh, it's called arcana the arcana chateau and then it's also so joystick required commodore 64 so this is basically it's a picture of a what looks like a chateau or a castle in the sort of you know austrian alps or something at night arcing over the top of this is the word arcana mm. which is okay but it's just so boring i don't know what this game is because i can't read that text Oh, and it nausea induce it. And, I, and all I can see is there, I see that the phrase holds the dark clerical, which sounds very painful. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about you, but no, I don't want anyone holding my dark clerical. I'm keeping that to myself, thanks. That's, uh... This is another virgin one, isn't it? So, this is, it? so what you've got at the bottom of this is, so this is a, I think it's an actual photo, isn't it? Yeah. I think it's an actual, I think it's an actual photo. So the, it's a very dark photo at the bottom. So then what they've decided to do in the bottom, because the bottom right is all taken up with the bit you can cut off and send for a copy of this game which no one's going to do but in the bottom left they've used dark red text very small dark red text on a very dark black trees background which you can't read <laughs> you can't you know, it's, it's a stylistic choice I'll give you that it's borderline <laughs> impossible isn't it I mean from what could, it says our uh, Arcana, Arcana, the castle of mysteries holds the dark clerical, get off my clerical, the most powerful black magic book ever known. Batador, <laughs> the hero of the game. <laughs> <laughs> Batador. I don't comes think I want to meet the, him. Land of, it comes from land the land of, of of bright hives. His quest is to find the dark clerical. Bright elves. Clavicle. It says elves. Oh, the dark bright uh, the land of bright elves. His quest is to find the dark clavicle and destroy it before its terrible knowledge falls, falls into, into the hands, the hands of, of the, the evil king Valeriquil, which sounds like a <laughs> headache tablet or a <laughs> doesn't it? If you've got a headache, try Valeriquil. <laughs> The smooth scrolling passages of Arcana ooh, are fiercely protected by all manner of harmful creatures. Harmful creatures, yet yeah, which, which he, he must, must repel, repel with his magic balls. Magic balls <laughs> of, of tremendous light. It's magic. I think it's bolts of luminous light, but it could be magic balls of luminous light. I read light. magic balls. Magic balls. There are fifty finely detailed rooms with many secrets for our hero to discover. He needs talismans to, to, do, def to defeat, defeat the, the demons demons, demons? The de demoires it looks like that guard, that guard the, book. the book then he must destroy it before he, for its sinister writings are revealed to valariquil valariquil <laughs> <laughs> just crap it's a really bad advert i can't get rid of this terrible backache have you tried valariquil <laughs> Actually, it sounds more like one of those awful thrush creams for women, doesn't it? Yeah. Like Vagisil. Valeriquil for women. Absolutely. When you suffer from that burning itch. Have you got the burning itch? Yes, I do. You need Valeriquil. <laughs> Sold at Chemist. Over the counter. Yeah, only over the counter. <laughs> Accidental soreness and scratching may, <sighs> may, may, may result. <laughs> <laughs> Smell of pot scratching is uh... perfectly normal. <laughs> oh, there you Mate go. Made for a 100% meat horse. <laughs> <laughs> you watch what he can do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's going to combine that with a sideways egg. Come to the sideways <laughs> egg for some Valera quill. <laughs> Wash it down with fresh meat horse. <laughs> Wash it down with some meat horse. Fresh meat horse, just for you. Absolutely. Freshly squeezed into a cup. <laughs> Freshly squeezed meat horse. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, it's, it's getting very late. 
it is late, and that advert is right. pantaloons beyond belief. Yeah, they both are. Right, what we got? What was going on in the charts back then? In at number 10 was Solo Flight 2. In at number nine, well, this is from Commodore User, uh, by the way. Uh, in at number nine was Tau City. Down to number eight was Silent Service. In at number seven was Speed King. In at number six was Ninja Master. Oh, Jesus. good lord. Down to number five was Thrust. Okay. In at number three was Night Games. And then our top three are Green Beret at three, Ghosts and Goblins at two, and straight in at number one, Leaderboard. Okay. All makes sense. There you go. Does indeed. So that's about it. What we got coming up in our next couple of episodes? We've got Arcana, (laughs) Beyond the Forbidden (laughs) Forest. Oh, Ooh, and then I don't know where these are adventure games. We've got something called Collapse. There's mm-hmm. Druid. Ah, uh, classic. I like Druid. Uh, yeah. Equinox. Hacker okay. Two. Ah, oh, interesting. Hole in One. Okay, it's not going to be um, as good as Leaderboard, but it's not, is it? Hollywood or Bust? Okay. Hoodoo Voodoo. Okay. Hot Wheels. Hot Wheels. Iridis Alpha. Ah, oh, your favourite mm. game. Mm. Night Rider. Oh dear. Oh god. Night Rider and Miami Vice Double Bill. Oh god. Eight is eight is terrible conversions. Okay. Uh, we've got Parallax, well, okay. Power Play, Spiky Harold, okay. Super Cycle, Two on Two Basketball, okay, and War. War. Rob Hubbard. The great piece of Rob Hubbard tune, isn't it? Mm, yes, it right. is. So it's that's all, good. another another load of games over the next couple of weeks. I think that's about it. I think it is from the site of the Sideways Egg. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're going to go off now and tuck into some um, meat, horse. meat horse. Fresh meat horse. Some meat horse. Squeeze, squeeze directly into our sideways eggshells, <laughs> which is what so, we drink from. So, so we're, we're going to spend a couple of hours now in the sideways egg, get, getting giddy on some egg juice and meat horse. And why, who wouldn't want to do that? I'd recommend it. Come and join us Absolutely. in the sideways egg. You're Absolutely. welcome anytime. And then, and then tomorrow we'll have some Valeriquil just to uh, settle our heads. <laughs> yes, Valeriquil. <laughs> When you've been out on the meat horse at the sideways egg, you need Valera Quill. <laughs> yes, check your dark clavicle just in case. <laughs> to clear out any uh, excess meat horse. <laughs> You'll need it. That stuff's oh. heavy. That's heavy on the bowel. Oh, dear. Right. These have been long episodes. They have. We hope you've enjoyed them. I have been Adrian Mills. I have been Graham Raddings. We have been Zapped to the Past. And we will see you again next week. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Zap to the Past podcast. We hope you enjoyed our deep dive into the world of Commodore 64 games, as well as the music, films and TV from around the 1980s, driven, of course, by the issue of Zap 64 magazine published at that time. We will return with a whole new batch of games and stuff to talk about next week. Until then, if you want to listen to or download previous episodes of Zap to the Past, and why wouldn't you? They can all be found on our website at zaptothepast.com, as well as being available on Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Deezer, Audible, Player FM, and, well, pretty much anywhere where we can upload them. By the way, we do always love to hear from our amazing listeners, so if you'd like to contact us about anything in the podcast or beyond, you can do so by emailing us at zaptothepast at gmail.com. We're also active on Twitter under at zaptothe, as well as Facebook, Instagram, and most social media platforms. Just search for Zap to the Past and you'll find us. Oh, and if you like the podcast and what we're doing, please do like, share, review, rate us. It really helps. Something, apparently. The Zap to the Past podcast is written and produced by Adrian Mills and Graham Raddings and recorded at Flaky Bits 2.0 Studio. All opinions expressed are those of the writers and while we indeed love Zap 64 magazine, the Zap to the Past podcast is not affiliated with it in any way. Stay safe, see you next time, and remember, we play these games so you don't have to.